I'd like to reconvene the June 14th, 2011 meeting of the Newport Beach City Council. May we have roll call, please? The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Thank you. Do we have a closed session report? We do, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the City Council met in closed session to discuss the matters reflected at Roman numeral 2 on its open session agenda. Uh, no reportable action was taken except with respect to Roman numeral 2B2 2 related to the Dennis Holland vote. The Council authorized proceeding with a civil action against Mr. Holland to under Chapter 10.64 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code to abate a public nuisance at 2200 Holiday. And that's it. Thank you. All right, if we may... Yes. And the vote was 7-0. My apologies. Okay. And if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mayor Pro Tem Gardner and then the invocation by Reverend Tim McCalmont of the Presbyterian Church of the Covenant. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, this evening we come together to do the business of the city. And we remember that we gather on the annual day that we salute our flag and those values and aspirations for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. As we stand as a nation under God, may we keep in mind those ideals you have ingrained in each of us, especially as important decisions are discussed and declared. A city, a cluster of people living and working in the same space around the ideal of the common good. For the city of Newport Beach, you desire a place where all people can live and work and play securely. These before us have been charged with the responsibility of watching over this city. We thank you for each council member and we ask that you encourage them and that through the decisions they make you would bring all wisdom and compassion to bear. We pray for their families and ask that each one daily would be conscious of their own character and behaviors that they might exemplify the noble calling to which they have been called. We also thank you for those who, as we speak, are on alert, ready to risk their lives on our behalf. We pray for their safety and ask that you be with their families as they perform these important duties. And finally, we lift up each administrator, secretary, receptionist, and maintenance worker of this city and ask for us all to be appreciative of their contributions. We pray strength and camaraderie for them as they do their work each day. And may all of this be in the interest of creating a better city, the city of Newport Beach, that is a model of what we envision as we salute our flag and more importantly, as we live for you and one another. In the name of the living Lord, I pray, amen. Thank you very much, Reverend. We have several presentations tonight, uh, the first of which is the City of Newport Beach Youth Council. And is Janet here to, Janet Cates? Well, good evening and thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Jonathan Harmon, I'm a recreation supervisor, and with me tonight is Janet Cates, recreation manager. And it was our pleasure this year to be the liaisons and advisors for the youth council program. It is, in fact, the 25th year of this excellent program of the youth council. And with us this year, we had 38 strong, excellent young uh, men and women on the board and they would like to give their annual presentation to you tonight. And without further ado, 
I'd like to call up Jeet and Dodgy, our chair and our co-chair, Alex Morrison, to give you a quick slideshow of what they've been up to all year. Thank you. Council members, I am Jason Digi, uh, President of the City of Newport Beach's Youth Council. Good evening. I am Alex Morrison, the Vice President of the Youth Council. Some of the responsibilities and uh, the purpose of the uh, Youth City Council are to primarily act as a liaison between the teenage youth of Newport Beach and the um, elected policy leaders of Newport Beach. Um, we, we, try, we strive to maintain a direct line of communication between these two age groups to uh, facilitate smooth and uh, helpful conduct between the two age groups as to further help our young community um, engender positive relations and educational growth. And uh, we also strive to promote youth involvement in such city government areas and spread awareness of this uh, oftentimes undervalued uh, profession. So what exactly does the Youth Council do? What exactly does the Youth Council do? Um, we do lots of volunteer work. For example, the uh, winter, winter, um, winter Wonderland Day. Yes, we volunteer for that. Um, each month we have guest speakers come in um, throughout the city. We have the city manager come in. We have the fire department come in. Uh, one of our main events is Youth Government Day, where um, uh, students from around the city come in, um, follow city employees around for the day. We advise the school district on teen programs, and we do fundraising. Uh, these are some of the special event pictures uh, that we have conducted. On the left, that's Alex Morrison at our city uh, Winter Wonderland program, which is a free event that citizens of Newport Beach can attend to foster positive um, community growth and relations. Uh, at the right, that's another picture at Winter Wonderland. Um, probably our most um, well-known event is Youth Government Day. Um, Youth Government Day on this was March 3rd, and um, basically students from around the, uh, the county come in and um, basically follow an uh, employee for the day. So on the left is a picture of um, a student following the city manager, learning about his position. Um, and each um, Youth Government Day we have two um, issues that we present at a council meeting. So throughout the day these students learn about how each um, employee is affected by these city issues and how they can respond to the city government or, um, mock meeting. Um, on the left is a picture of a student with the city clerk, um, basically going around the city, seeing what her job entails throughout the day. And on the right, we have a student um, with the information, ex information technology employee. Um, on the left, we have um, students learning what the city council exa um, exactly does, um, what their job entails, and how they proceed with um, different votings. And on the right, we have a student with the recreations department learning basically what they do. And finally, at the end of the day, um, all students that have interned with their respective uh, department heads gather and present information to the mock city council that has also been chosen. And in a, a mock city council meeting, these uh, agendas are brought up and discussed upon and um, action is taken based on the students own personal views and the information given on that day and this is one of our best um, one of the best activities that the city youth council runs because it gives students a chance to uh, have hands-on experience with uh, out of classroom experiences that really foster education in this area of uh, city government um, as I previously said, each month we have a meeting and we have guest speakers. So um, some of our more well well-known guest speakers, we had the Newport Beach City uh, Fire Department come and talk to us and we um, uh, visited the fire department right over there across the street and just talked about how their uh, action affects us and we basically just learned about them. And also we had the Marine Protection Education Group come and talk to us and just give us a basic overview of what their job is. It's pretty interesting, we just learned about the city and try to um, give ins our insight as the youth. Also some of the guest speakers that are invited to speak are entrepreneurs and other influential community members um, such as green building and um, other interesting tidbits of information that are offered to these students uh, on the youth council 
to foster an all-around more general education that then is offered at school, uh, more career developing. And at the NMUSD Board of Education, uh, the Youth Council was honored and presented with certificates and awards for uh, positive community growth and uh, helping student education and further uh, student education as part of our mission. Some of our future goals uh, for this program would be to um, expand our traditional projects and take on more projects that uh, we are capable of, expanding our member base to more schools and representing more schools in the area because as of right now, it's primarily only Corona Del Mar High School and Newport Harbor High School uh, and with only maybe one or two members from schools such as uh, OSHA and STAGE. So uh, we are definitely trying to try and expand our member base to cover more student agendas and more student opinions from different areas. Lastly, we'd like to thank Steve, um, Steve, our council member Steve Rosansky for helping us out during some of the meetings. It was very helpful. And also um, Karen Yelsia, the NMUSD board member, um, she was very nice and asked us our opinions on some of the school board issues. And thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, do, we have, do we have other members of the youth council here with us? We do, if you would all stand up. And uh, do we want to take a picture here, Leilani? So why don't, we, why don't you come on down, we'll take a picture. Steve, you want to join us for the picture? Well, I think I see a lot of future city council members out there, so it's a great group. Thanks a lot, kids. Okay. Our uh, next presentation tonight is uh, the Disneyland Scholarship Award. Um, and I had the pleasure of joining um, Abby Michelson and her family over at Disneyland uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and Abby is here tonight. I trust, I don't see, is, is Renee Torico here? Oh, here she is, okay. There we go. I um, have a proclamation here that I'd like to read. Wonderful. <clears throat> Whereas any member of the community can effect positive change with any volunteer action, no matter how big, or small, and whereas volunteers can connect with the local community service opportunities through community service organizations such as schools, churches, or not-for-profit organizations, and whereas on a daily basis volunteers work in their communities utilizing their time and talent to make a real difference in the lives of children, adults, and the elderly, and whereas Abigail Michelson began volunteering with the American Heart Association three years ago in honor of her father who died of a heart attack when she was nine years old. By volunteering and working with AHA, Abigail discovered a passion for health advocacy which she shares by inspiring others to make healthy changes in their life to prevent heart disease and other health issues. And whereas Abigail Michelson helped raise more than $2,500 for the American Heart Association through her Health and Heart Club, she also created a heart club toolkit and program to recruit other teens to start clubs at their schools and currently has eight Orange County high schools involved with the heart club program. And whereas Abigail Michelson also spends time volunteering with Project Success, Junior Pearls of Beckstrand Cancer Foundation, Newport Beach Auxiliary of Children's Home Society, 
and Temple Shir Hama uh, Lo yeah. Lot. <laughs> okay. And whereas uh, the city of Newport Beach recognizes the value of volunteers and proudly joins the Disneyland Resort in congratulating this volunteer in receiving the Disneyland Resort Scholarship celebrating community service. Now therefore, I, Michael Hinn, Mayor of the City of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire City of Newport Beach City Council, do hereby recognize and honor Abigail Michelson of Newport Harbor High School for being the recipient of the Disneyland Resort Scholarship. In witness hereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Newport Beach to be affixed this 14th day of June, June 2011. Congratulations, Abby. <laughs> Renee or Abby, did you care to make any comments? Um, you know, Abby is a, is a wonderful student. She's a great leader, a great community leader. Um, the Disneyland Resort since 2006 has given over $300,000 to graduating high school seniors. So those seniors who just gave a presentation, um, I mean, they have an opportunity to make a change in in the community and in the world around them. And, and Abby is a perfect example of that and we are proud to have her as one of our $5,000 grant recipients. So, this yeah. is only one of the many recognitions she's gotten. She was back in Washington, D.C. being nationally recognized as one of the outstanding student volunteers across the country just a couple of months ago. And, and, and an awardee uh, at the academic honors uh, that the um, that uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce had too. So congratulations, Thank Abby, you. really terrific. Can I come down and give you this and we'll yes. take a picture? Always makes me feel bad about what I was doing when I was 18 years old. <laughs> okay, our next presentation is the LEAF Award, which is Leaders of Environmental Action Films winner. And uh, do we have, uh, well, Nancy, did you want to? Make any comments? All right. Just that we, we have had the opportunity to see a number of the films that the students made, and they're just terrific. Right. All right. Well, my name is Anna Rothwell. I am the founder of LEAF. It's Leaders of Environmental Action Films. And basically what it is is in empowering youth to be environmental leaders through film, music, and technology. The city of Newport Beach has been one of our founding partners, along with the Newport Beach Film Festival, uh, the Department of Education for California. This year, the National Environmental Education Foundation joined us as a joint partner, and we did a national contest with them themed on oceans. Um, we also have Volcom, um, Etnies, we have, um, let's see, you name it, uh, Susan Rockefeller, Ed Bagley Jr., McGee, he's a resident here. Um, we have the cool factor along with the environmental factor. So I would, we have a couple winners, um, finalists that came from Newport Beach, that's actually why I'm here. Um, one's from Sage Hill, Brooke Westerfelt, and then another from Newport Mesa. And we just wanted to show really quickly the results. And this is, I've been seen at Newport Beach Film Festival, um, at AG Staples Center for LA Live, the Earth Day event. It's been uh, My Hero Film Festival. We just showed at Laguna Fest. Um, we're gonna be showing, uh, we just showed at Tree People. And basically it's a powerful voice of the youth having the platform to be able to speak about what matters to them. And the contest allows them 30, 60 seconds, whatever 
passionate thing that they have uh, they want to speak about about the environment we have over 210 commercials submitted just in California most of them are from Orange County so So this is the intro from Volcom. Um, it ran on Fuel TV, which reaches 30 million viewers. And give me audio. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> no audio. Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry. Well, anyhow. This is one of the top surfers for Volcom, and his name um, is Alex Gray, and he's done two of our promos. Um, you can just, maybe we'll just show you the first, you can understand by just seeing the first one. Um, this is our first place winner, Actions Follow Us. He's from Irvine, Northwood, um, same student last year went. Actually got accepted by USC Film School. He put Leaf at the top of his resume. Um, and gave us a really nice statement of support of why Leaf made a difference for him. I introduced him to Oscar winners from the Cove, and he got internships along the way this last year. I don't know if you want to see the other ones, but I just want to say the youth have a powerful message. They have something to say. They're very concerned. They are the future leaders. They're about to be 18 to vote. They're choosing their colleges. Um, our rewards, they also, aside from really cool prizes, cash prizes, um, they get certificates of accomplishment from UCI. And now, as you can see, they also get recognized by um, industry leaders. We have a Celebrity Choice uh, Award. So we have some of the top uh, producers and directors looking at their work. Um, and the whole thing is really to empower the youth to be leaders and whether they go into the environmental film or they just choose whatever capacity. And the next thing that we're actually looking at, the Grammy Museum would like to uh, partner with us to do an eco music contest because I've received so many uh, um, emails from kids because they would like copyrights to music. So instead of worrying about that, I thought why not do a contest where youth create the music and we have a library and we recognize the youth with Grammy Award winners. So. All right. So go to leafrocks.com. Thank you so much, the city of Newport. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, she, uh, thank you for helping and courage. And then also Leslie Daigle has been with us along the way the whole time. So um, thank you so much, Shane Berkeley uh, from the city of Newport. We did Rob Machado's uh, water PSA that's running in every theater and this very powerful message about water conservation. So the city, I, I thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much, Anna. Very impressive. Okay, our final presentation for this evening is the Citizen of the Year, Tom Johnson. I have a proclamation. Is Tom here? Okay, I'm going to read the proclamation and then I'll just take a picture by myself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there we go. All right, well, uh, Tom is really a great guy and a great recipient uh, for Citizen of the Year Award. Uh, the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas the Newport Beach Citizen of the Year Award is presented to that individual who best represents the qualities each of us admire and respect among our friends, neighbors, and associates, and whereas it is not given for outstanding single effort as much as for long-term continuing commitment to the community, and whereas it is for the one who says, Newport Beach is my home and my life, and its future and mine are in the same, uh, and whatever I can do to make it better, I will do. And whereas Tom Johnson presently oversees Johnson Media Group, a public relations and marketing firm that he recently completed a startup launch for Firebrand Media, 
with the Newport Beach Independent. He previously, used, he previously served as publisher of Times Community News, overseeing a group of community newspapers, which included the Daily Pilot from 1991 to 2008. During his ten tenure, the Daily Pilot won many awards, including General Excellence, the highest award presented by the California Newspaper Publishers Association. And whereas Tom Johnson's involvement in the community has been extensive as a two-time chairman of Hogue Hospital's 552 Club, immediate past president of Orange County Youth Sports Foundation, past president and longtime board member of the Costa Mesa Chamber of Commerce, past skipper of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce Commodores Club, current board member and past chairman of Visit Newport Beach, past board member president and founder of Costa Mesa 900, and past member of the Costa Mesa United, he presently serves on the boards of the Newport Harbor Area Boys and Girls Club, Cho Choose Nursing, Choose Hogue, Irrelevant Week, and San Diego State University's Orange County Council. And whereas Tom Johnson was named Costa Mesa Man of the Year in 1998, Commodore of the Year in 1999, received the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce Silver Anchor Award in 2006, Hogue Hospital's President's Circle Award in 2007, and Visit Newport Beach's Partners in Progress Award in 2009-10. And whereas Tom and his wife, Vicki, reside in Newport Beach, and they have two grown children, daughters, Ash Ashley and Victoria. Now, therefore, I, Michael Henn, Mayor of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire Newport Beach City Council, declare Friday, June 17, 2011, as a day in which the City of Newport Beach and the Newport Chamber of Commerce honor Tom Johnson as the 2011 Newport Beach Citizen of the Year. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Newport Beach to be affixed this 14th day of June, 2011. I think we can give Tom a hand in absentia. Now I not only feel bad where I was when I was 18, but where I am today. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, yes. uh, I might uh, add that uh, this Friday evening the public is invited, but is the gala celebration of uh, uh, Tom's uh, Citizenship of the Year, and it will be held at the Fairmont Hotel. It begins at 6.30, and if anyone would like to attend, uh, it's a three-course meal uh, with wine and uh, dancing. And uh, reservations can be made at NewportBeach.com. Thank you very much, Rush. Okay, on to the notice to the public. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the council. Speakers must limit comments to five minutes on agenda items. The council has the discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Now is the time for council announcements or matters which council members would like placed on our future agenda for discussion, action, or report. Council Member Daigle. Uh, yes, I attended the annual meeting of uh, a group called SPAWN, which is Stop Polluting Our Newport. Uh, they've been along, around a long time, and among their achievements was capping the flights at John Wayne Airport, uh, keeping the upper Newport Bay as an estuary, and preventing a freeway through Corona del Mar. Uh, so they've been a very effective group over the years um, in their purpose. They're dedicated to preserving the charm and beauty of Newport Beach and they're now working closely with Airfare and Airfare is a, a citizens advocacy group that's been very helpful to the city in the past few years as we build our, our relationships across the region. And then secondly I attended the uh, event by My Ocean, uh, another group uh, dedicated uh, to water quality uh, and in this case, they're particularly concerned about urban runoff that um, comes into our oceans. And there's a lot of uh, business people that are very involved with my ocean, uh, mainly because they recognize the asset uh, that our oceans and water bring to our property and to our communities. So wonderful events and uh, glad in a difficult uh, economy these groups are, are, have full attendance at their events. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Curry. No items. Council Member Selledge. Uh, yes, well, I actually didn't have anything to announce, but um, my wife's heavily involved in Irrelevant Week, and she sent me an email. If I know what's good for me, I'm going to read it. Um, 
If, as you may know, Irrelevant Week is where the uh, last draft pick of the NFL is honored. And this year it's the 36th annual uh, Irrelevant Week. It kicks off on Monday, June 20th at Newport Dunes from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. with a kickoff arrival beach party to welcome the last draft pick of the NFL, Mr. Irrelevant, Cheetah Zugwa, who was chosen by the Houston Texans. There will be live music, a no-host bar, hot dogs, hamburgers, and chili being cooked by the Newport Beach Fire Department for $10 a person. Lots of fun for the whole family. And then on Wednesday, June 22nd, the All-Star Irrelevant Week Lozman Banquet will be here at Lozman. That's the lowest guy in the totem pole. Uh, will be held at the Newport Beach Marriott featuring Irrelevant Week founder Paul Salata and a panel of NFL players and celebrities who will roast Mr. Irrelevant and present him with the coveted Lozman trophies. So for tickets, call 949-263-0727 or log on to uh, www.irrelevantweek.com for more information. Thanks, honey. Oh, this is supposed to read the end there. <laughs> You're welcome, sweetheart. Are you done? I'm done. Okay. Uh, Council Member Hill. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of attending uh, the 50th annual Athletic Awards Banquet celebrating uh, the success of the top 15 athletes from Harbor High and Corona Del Mar High School. Uh, I've been to several of them and I'm absolutely always amazed at the GPA that these strong athletes achieve after dedicating so much time to uh, uh, their athletic uh, endeavors. <coughs> um, I was never on either of those lists. So, um, uh, but a great event and uh, sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce and uh, the Commodores Club. When you see it happen next year, there's both the academic and the athletic, and it's amazing how many students attend both. Okay, Council Member Rosansky. Nothing, thank you. Yeah. Member Tim Gardner. Nothing. Okay, uh, it's been uh, three weeks since the last council meeting. It's a pretty busy time of the year, and so I and my council colleagues, most all of us in one time or another, uh, attend a lot of events. Uh, not the least of which was the grand opening of the pavilion store here on the peninsula in the newly re refurbished and remodeled uh, landmark shopping center at 32nd Street right near City Hall here. That was on Thursday the 11th. Uh, the Corona Del Mar 5K Fun Run was held on June the 4th. Um, I was able to start the race and run in it along with City Manager Dave Kiff. And uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, the Balboa Island Parade on June 5th, always a great event. The Newport Harbor High School Character Awards were held on June the 7th. That was uh, one that I had to absolutely go to. You can't turn down a Character Awards uh, event. And then uh, Visit Newport Beach, uh, their annual dinner was held on June the 8th in the Island Hotel. And uh, I did a Meet the Mayor on Saturday, June 11th in the Westside Community Center. And then Barry Saywitz, uh, every year now for the last several years, has held a, an event to raise money for autism at his home. Uh, it's a great event, a lot of fun, uh, June the 11th. We do have, uh, in addition to the things that have already been mentioned, two things coming up this week uh, that I wanted to draw your attention to, and that is uh, the Tidelands Committee, the Tidelands Management Committee, will be held on uh, tomorrow, June 15th, at the Oasis Center at uh, 4 p.m., and then on Thursday, the Neighborhood Revitalization Committee will meet um, at the Council Chambers beginning again at 4 p.m. Those two committees were recently formed as a part of our priorities for the year. They're extremely important committees with important work agendas, and so I hope uh, lots of people attend. And uh, so with that, uh, on to the consent calendar. All matters. Matters listed under consent calendar items 1 through 23 and supplemental item S30 are considered by council to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. The council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the council votes on the motion unless members of the council staff or the public request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Members of the public who wish to discuss a consent calendar item should come forward to the lectern upon invitation by the mayor and state their name and item number. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. Thank you. Councilmember Hill, did you have anything to pull? None. 
Councilmember Rosansky? None, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner? None. And Councilmember Daigle? None, none, thank you. Councilmember Curry? No, I have And Councilmember Selich? I have none. And I have none. Does staff any have anything to pull? Uh, one, Mr. Mayor. Item three, I'm going to ask that that be continued till next time for first reading. There is a, um, it appears that we gave you a red line, which wasn't a true red line in the staff report. So in the abundance of caution, I'd like to continue that till next time. So that would involve pulling it, I imagine, changing the recommendation. So we'll pull the item and then move to continue? That's correct. Okay. Do any members of the public have an item to pull from the consent calendar? Denise Oberman, good evening. I'd like to pull item number 11 and have a brief discussion with regard to it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Jim Mosher. I was going to discuss item three, but I would like to pull item six through nine about the four business improvement districts um, so that I can make a single comment on them as a unit. Okay. Any other members of the public wish to pull an item? All right. And then item number 23, I guess we're going to uh, continue that item as well. Which is the recommended action, so you can leave it yeah, on the consent calendar. So we'll calendar. just note that, that that's the recommended action for item number 23. May I have a motion for the consent calendar? Move items 1 and 2, 4 and 5, 10, 12, through 22 with the notation that 23 is continued and item 30. Second. Okay. Please vote. I have a number of resolutions to oh, read. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> item 4, resolution number 2011-45, a resolution of the City Council of City of Newport Beach determining and establishing an appropriations limit for fiscal year 2011 12, in accordance with Article 13B of the California Constitution and Government Code, Section 7910. Item 5, Resolution Number 2011-46, a resolution of the City Council of City of Newport Beach authorizing the Public Works Director and or City Engineer as the authorized represent representative to execute all necessary agreements and amendments for federally funded projects on behalf of the City Council. Item 6, Resolution Number 2011-47. Oh, that was pulled. 6, 7, 8, and 9. So item 10, resolution number 2011-51, resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach concerning the status of the circulation element for the City of Newport Beach. And item S30, resolution number 2011-56, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach authorizing the temporary closure of Seashore Drive, Newport Boulevard, Back Bay Drive, and Balboa Boulevard, selected parking lots, and selected feeder streets. And with that, the motion carries. Thank you. For those that uh, may not be familiar, uh, it's been identified some time back that uh, we should be required to read the titles aloud for uh, motions and ordinances before they are enacted. And that's what we're doing for those items that were on the consent calendar. Okay. Uh, as to items pulled, number three was pulled. Uh, do I have a motion to continue? So moved. Second. Second. Please vote. Public comment. Uh, do we have any public comment on that item? Seeing none, please vote. Okay. Motion carries unanimously. All right. And then uh, items six through nine were pulled by Mr. Mosher. Yeah. Thank you, Mary Ann and members of the council. Again, my name is Jim Mosher. Uh, the staff has agendized items six through nine as routine matters, but I, I think attention needs to be drawn to certain matters involving the four so-called business improvement districts. As I understand it, these were created by an earlier council back in the 1990s under a state law that permits you to levy additional taxes on businesses. Under that law, they seem rather easy to set up, but once created, membership is not voluntary. And if those being taxed are unhappy, it takes a very concerted effort on their, the part of the dissidents to force one to be dissolved. Also, the official description of the boards as advisory is a bit of a misnomer, since their relationship to you is much the same as the relationship um, that you have to the city manager. 
That is, they serve at your pleasure, and you give them a budget of tax money each year to work with, and having done that, they have considerable latitude over deciding how to spend it. These business improvement districts are not then just trivial honorary committees, and I am a bit concerned about the ra rather casual way in which they seem to be appointed. I'm not even sure from these staff reports, for example, um, if you're appointing these people for the four-year terms required by our charter, or if the terms are staggered as the charter also requires. Equally importantly, a state law called the Maddie Act, implemented in your own policy A2, requires the clerk to announce and publicize each January all opportunities for service on council controlled boards that will be arising during the year. I don't think these opportunities were announced for these boards. In addition, each, our charter requires each board to file its bylaws and regulations with the clerk as the Board of Library Trustees just did in Agenda Item 21, so that those affected can know the rules and regulations under which they operate. And while I, I don't doubt that Scott Palmer would be happy to make the bylaws available, I don't think they're currently on file with the clerk. Likewise, I could be wrong, but I don't think these board members have been filing with the clerk the Form 700 Financial Disclosure Statements, conflict of interest, uh, that would normally be expected of folks who have control over taxpayer money. Finally, you and earlier councils have established additional voluntary policies to further good governance of all the boards you appoint. Policy A2 requires that you be, pres be presented with at least two candidates for each vacancy, as was done for other boards and commissions in item 20, which you just passed, and that no person serve on more than one board commission or standing committee at a time. And if you look at these proposed uh, memberships, you'll find many of these committees interlock with one another and that many of these persons, fine as they may be, are already serving on other boards and commissions. Uh, I don't think the rules imposed by state law and by our charter should be optional. And while some may be, I think the earlier councils put those rules in place for good reason. Um, if you take the recommended action on these four business improvement board appointments tonight, I hope you will make it explicitly clear which of the normal policies you are waiving. Thank you. Uh, David, are the bids the same as our other committees? I don't believe so. They're actually established under the vehicle code and the state law. They're in fact separate. They're part of the city, but they're not part of our boards and commissions. They're not a committee of the council per se they actually have more independent power, albeit they are a functioning portion of the city. They've never been considered part of our boards and commissions, certainly not under our charter, and they're not considered part of your committees pursuant to A2. Uh, we'll be happy to look at any other issues raised by Mr. Mosier. I, I, I don't I, see I know that issue. in the last year and a half or so, we have had your office review all of the bylaws and bring yes. them into the line, and we've done other compliance issue, measures, uh, I just had not thought about them as being a, no, a committee I, in the same way. Right. They're not in the same way as your normal boards and commissions, and they're certainly not charter boards and commissions. And yes, the city reviews all contracts and is involved, and the staff actually takes care of all of the expenditures of funds. It's really not an independent function like Mr. Mosier has indicated, but we'll be happy to look at the issues he's raised. I guess I have a question. Uh, do you see any reason why we would not proceed with the agenda items this evening? I do not. Okay. Uh, Council Member Curry? I would move approval of items uh, six through nine. Second. All right. Do we have any other public comment on these items? Seeing none, please vote. I must read the resolutions for items six through nine. Resolution number 2011-47, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach declaring its intention to renew the Newport Beach Restaurant Association Business Improvement District for the fiscal year of July 1, 2011 to June 30, 2012, and fix the time and place of a public hearing. For item seven, resolution number 2011-48, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach declaring its intention to renew the Balboa Village Business Improvement District for the fiscal year July 1, 2011 to June 30, 2012, and fix the time and place of a public hearing. 
Item 8, resolution number 2011-49, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach declaring its intention to renew the Marine Avenue Business Improvement District for, for the fiscal year of July 1, 2011 to June 30, 2012 and fix the time and place of a public hearing. And item 9, resolution number 2011-50, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach declaring its intention to renew the Corona Del Mar Business Improvement District for the fiscal year of July 1, 2011 to June 30, 2012 and fix the time and place of a public hearing. With that, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, um, item number 11 was pulled. Mayor, City Council. Uh, we understand that the council has approved a preliminary concept and not a final plan for the Lido Village. And, pardon? Denise Oberman. There are uh, two or three landowners and developers who we can appreciate would like to have some type of design and landscape concept to help them to market their property for sale uh, and who would like to direct the surrounding uses uh, in the design concepts to improve the attractiveness of their parcels. However, I think it's uh, a little bit premature for the city uh, to invest in as well as to establish specific guidelines of this nature. The anchor uses for the entire Lido Village have yet to be confirmed and no developers or investors have been identified in that regard. Anchor developers will definitely want and should have the opportunity to provide direct input and probably influence the architectural and landscape design, both for their immediate parcel and to assure the compatibility and promote attractiveness of the entire and surrounding area. Also with regard to the selection of professionals for this, uh, Hesmalak is a fine firm. However, their focus is on the residential uh, design components, most notably seniors, affordable housing, and some other specialty housing with a limited amount of retail. They don't have marine and coastal resort experience, including hospitality, which is gonna be a critical success factor as acknowledged in the public hearings relative to the entire Lido Village area. So we strongly urge the city to reconsider the selection of professionals to assist with this at the appropriate time so that the city does have what it needs to make this a successful destination resort area as well as one that the community can use. So we request that the city council not approve this commitment for funds or the selection of this design professional's assistance until such time as the Lido Village anchor developer investors are identified and committed. Thank you so much. Okay. Is there any other public comment on this item? I guess in response to the comments that were made, really the anchor owners and developers are represented in this design uh, group. Uh, it is the owners of the principal parcels, all of the principal parcels in this uh, design area. And I did want to make it clear that these design guidelines really are mainly to do with landscaping, streetscape, uh, generalized appearance as opposed to specifics of uh, who would be the tenants and that sort of thing in these, uh, in these areas. And so um, this process was uh, really generated and furthered and uh, encouraged by those principal landowners uh, all of whom want to move forward with redevelopment uh, but want to do so with the confidence that uh, all the other principal landowners will be executing in a similar fashion. So uh, from my perspective, I, I think this is a reasonable thing for us to move forward with that should not uh, negatively impact the ultimate development of these parcels. Um, does anybody else on council? Well, right. I had a, had a question. Sure. Um, how does this f work with the uh, revitalization committee and any activities they would be taking in, the, in this particular site? So the revitalization committee is overseeing this on behalf of the city, which is a participant in this design guideline process. And um, it'll, it's our intention to assure that the public will be involved, that there will be public outreach um, and public input into these design guidelines as we go forward. And the, Revitalization Committee will make sure that that happens. Council Member Hill? I would just uh, echo your comments, Mr. Mayor. 
And in fact, the uh, stakeholders uh, are paying for a significant portion of this work uh, to be done. There is one just minor nit on hand page 21 of the agreement. They talk about a basement update, and it's a typo. It's a base map okay. update that they'll be doing. So. Uh, um, well, go ahead if you'd like to make a comment. Uh, my name is Tom Larkin, and frankly, I think your whole development is in trouble, as you and I know have discussed, Mike. Um, I can't talk about why because it's not on the agenda at this particular point, but uh, there are no people interested in buying the piece over on Lido Marina Village, okay? And um, as you and I have also discussed, Mr. Duda, who is the biggest peace holder here is not particularly excited up until this other thing is taken care of and I don't see why you would put up money now when there is so much undecided if you would uh, activity hanging out there Bernardo wants to sell they don't want to develop anything and uh, given the fact that Bernardo is not particularly happy about adding more money into the area given the fact that the property is not particularly saleable at this, at this time, and given the fact that Mr. Duda is not particularly interested in plowing more money into it, I don't know why you would be spending money on a uh, landscape project until you know what you've got in front of you, and you're a long way from that point. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Is there any other comment on this? Okay, do we have any other discussion here at council? All right, please vote. So it's been moved, there's been, I didn't hear a second, I'm sorry. Moved by Council Member Selich. Thank you. Okay, please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, it's now time for public comment on items that are not on the agenda this evening. Does anyone wish to make a comment on a non-agenda item this evening? Okay. My name is Michael Turner, and I represent a landscape company by the name of Dan's Landscape. Um, Dan's been in business for 30 years plus in doing business in the Orange County area and currently has projects in Newport Beach. My topic or quick uh, comments for discussion are some notes from a couple of staff meetings ago regarding blower bands <coughs> and uh, maybe give staff some things to think about. I've spoken with a staff member to understand current goals of that ban. One would be noise, two would be dust and debris. Um, suggesting that maybe in that evolution of that ban, there be some type of decibel rating um, that currently hasn't been planned or as part of staff's like, at current processing. The other thing is, is that even though gas blowers would be banned according by this uh, ordinance, there are current electric blowers that would comply with the ordinance, however, actually be louder in noise. So that would kind of negate the goal of wanting to accomplish uh, a lower noise factor. The second goal is to basically eliminate dust and debris from being in the air. Um, if it was electric blower, that wouldn't be accomplished. A couple suggestions for staff is to move forward and search out manufacturers that could be a recommended list of machines that would comply with the ban um, and just be recommended. Um, or should I say suggested, not recommended. Um, the other one is that there's probably only one manufacturer to my um, kind of discovery and due diligence that makes um, a gas blower that actually, or, and it's a switch, it has a vacuum that would comply with a lower noise to equal electric machines and accomplish your goal of actually taking debris out um, from being dust in the air. So that was a couple quick comments and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you.
My name is Kevin Doan. I have a business over in Vio Porto. And um, I, I'm a little concerned about the parking meter situation. Now, I've been paying attention a little bit last year when you raised the rates and stuff. That was okay. We kind of see that that has to be done. But now with the parking meters, they're starting to uh, take away the lo longer term, the four hour, 12 hour, the meters are starting to disappear. I've been on the website for about two days now looking for uh, someone who to talk to. I've called City Hall, we'll get back with you. I have not gotten any return calls. And this is like the third time that I've had a problem um, having the business over there. Uh, we were, we've considered moving, but we decided because of all the things that uh, the, uh, uh, the property manager has been doing for uh, painting, cleaning up, we thought that was going to assist us in keeping our clientele. And <laughs> now we're having complaints about parking, uh, the meters. Um, my wife owns the hair salon. Now, I don't know you ladies, but if you have an uh, hour and a half to get your hair done, that's fine. But most of my wife's clients are there for two and a half to three hours. All the meters that are, you know, you guys are changing all the meters around here to two hours. Now, um, I would like to see if you guys could at least leave a, a, some of the four hours, a minimum four hours, um, available. The 12 hours, I understand the change into that. The other thing I'd like to see <laughs> is that if um, you could put somewhere on the website how to use the cell phone, pay by cell, or I, you know, there's no instructions. I watched the, the meeting where you guys had the guy come in and do the little video, and all he showed was how to do the pay when you park in a, in a multi-unit. Um, nobody sent us flyers, nobody let us know that the changes were being made, and our clients have been here. We've been here 16 years, and our clients are starting to really complain. The parking structure, they rip us off every time we have somebody park. We give them stickers, and they end up, uh, you know, charging them double or making them pay no matter what the stickers say. So I've had the Davenport, and I've been discussing that, but I'd just really like to see if you guys could at least keep some of the longer-term meters. It would really be helpful for our business. Okay, Dave, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. Or I'm going to walk him back and talk with the finance director. Okay. This is Dave Kiff, our city manager. He'll make sure you get connected to someone that can answer all your questions. I know one of the attractions of our discussions of meters in Crown Del Mar was the fact that you could have, it might be 15 minutes, it might be five hours, depending on what the business was and the needs. So it seems we could use some flexibility there. And I don't know that we're changing out the hours. I'll need to check on that. That's a surprise to me. It usually takes an ordinance to kind of change. Okay. Further public comment? My name is Bruce Blackman. I have Blackman Limited Jewelry Store, which I've had on Via Oporto for 50 years now, 54 years. And I'd like to speak on the impact that we're having from Coronado and their leasing agents. Right now, by letting more of these people around our, our, our area, <clears throat> I regularly pick up in our patio something like two dozen cigarette butts every morning. I've tried to let them know over there this is not the place to have their people smoke. They've moved them over to the parking lot in front of the bank building over here. I've noticed, watched that happen. Now they're on our third floor of the parking structure where they're even taking gas caps off and breathing the fumes from the gas tanks. <laughs> At any rate, it doesn't seem to me that the Renato's leasing agents are doing the right thing, especially by leasing an uh, area in the second story of the parking structure now to their people. I see them, the poorly dressed people crying and smoking and stuff on the bench right below that. They say that this is all professional people and office people up there but that's not really so. It's just going on every day, and it's not very pleasant for our clientele to watch this. Not are you, Bruce, are you speaking of uh, Morningside, people that are visiting Morningside in Leo yes. Community Village? Yes, the Morningside okay. people, as uh, encouraged by the, the, the leasing agents, too. They're leasing to those people. The Morningside people, they seem to have no regard for what they're clients look like or anything like that. But it is a, a blight, and, and especially when the city is trying to rebuild that area and make it into a lovely place like it used to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank, Thank you, Bruce. Uh, may we? Yeah, may we? May we, uh, may we maintain decorum, please? Go ahead, Tom. Tom Billings, Newport Beach. I just wanted to add to uh, Mr. Blackman's testimony to clarify something. He mentioned uh, Bornado as the leasing agent. In addition to Bornado, um, th there are offices that Morningside leases that are privately owned along the Bialito stretch, too. So it's not just Bornado leasing agent. It's also the owners of 3404 Bialito uh, and um, uh, on the front there. So. Anyway, I know we're going to bring this up on another agenda item later, but I just wanted to clarify that it's, it's more than just one uh, owner there. Are there other public comments on non-agenda items? Okay, let me clarify something. Uh, these last two comments have, it have to do with uh, the business of Morningside in Lido Marina Village, which is not the same as the agenda item this evening, which is has to do with the development agreement and zoning agreement that the city has with Morningside. However, it uh, may be appropriate for our city attorney to make some comments regarding Morningside in Lido Marina Village. David, can you tell us where we stand with that? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I can. I, I would just also note, too, that we will address the issue in the context of the uh, zoning agreement review as well. and We can address that concept, but for the benefit of the audience, uh, as many people here know, we issued, the city issued, a, well, a number, two letters, but one in particular approximately 30 days ago indicating to Morningside that their current uses as some of those locations were inconsistent with the zoning code. They were given 30 days to, in order to abate. That 30 days ran on Sunday. Uh, last week, code enforcement made a request to, uh, to do an inspection of those, those facilities. This week, actually on Monday or Tuesday of this week, uh, which it didn't have a response to, but we have now had a response from Morningside, and we will be in inspecting those facilities before the end of this week. If they are still not in compliance, we will take action, appropriate action to address that issue, um, and we will be moving forward with all due speed to address and bring those facilities into compliance with the zoning code. Or abate the use. That's exactly what would be, need to be done if it didn't get changed. Yes, it would need to be abated. Okay. All right, any other public comment on non-agenda items? Okay, uh, then let's move on to oral reports from City Council on committee activities. Council Member Daigle. Uh, yes, uh, I'm the city's represent representative on uh, vector control and it's an uh, agency in Garden Grove and they're concerned with the mosquitoes and ants and kinds of things that transmit and carry diseases. and. As a homeowner, one of the services that they do provide is if you feel that um, pest control comes to your home and doesn't correctly identify the problem, you can call Vector Control. And they have uh, lots of uh, retired college professors that can look through microscopes and, and help you out. Uh, one of the issues that we're dealing with uh, here in Newport Beach is in Big Canyon, uh, we have a real uh, mosquito uh, problem. There's kind of a water area with some cattails. And so over the years, um, <clears throat> Vector Control's uh, solution has been, you know, pesticides and larvicides and adulticides, and it's becoming very expensive, and the mosquitoes are, are very resilient. So what Vector Control would like to do is to have a project with the city and basically have public works um, get in there with a backhoe and, and clear out some of those areas. Um, so we can look forward to, it's going to be about a $50,000 project, but uh, what it means for us is, is less mosquitoes. So that's uh, coming down the line. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Curry. The uh, Finance Committee met uh, yesterday and had a very good meeting. We had an entrance uh, interview with our new auditors. The, count, uh, the city did uh, change its auditors uh, to a brand new firm who will be doing the city's uh, annual uh, comprehensive uh, financial report. Uh, we also reviewed our investment policy. Uh, we uh, did a, a significant update of that last year, so there's no significant changes or no changes to be made this year. And we're going to, because we have now taken on some significant debt, we're going to be crafting and putting into place a series of debt policies that will uh, provide guidance for the city in the future should it ever uh, have occasion to do a debt or bonds again. And we also took a look at the budget checklist, which we'll talk about uh, later in today's uh, council meeting. Okay. Council Member Selich? Uh, no reports. Council Member Hill? No reports. 
And Council Member Rosansky? None, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner? Yes, this morning we had the meeting of the Marine Committee of the Chamber. And there are two issues at the state level that I think the city might want to comment on. One is involving life jackets, and that may seem minor, but right now the proposal is that any vessel under 18 feet, yes, it could be interpreted to include surfboards, bodyboards, everything. Um, and what they're asking for is comments at this point. And I think the city should comment, one, on excluding all boards, of course, but also maybe suggesting a two-tier approach, because if we have a five-mile-per-hour harbor, I would wonder how many fatalities we've had. Um, and it was suggested by the, the boaters in there that a lot of people who take their duffies are probably not going to want to put on lifeboats if they're going to a restaurant or something. So I just think that's something that we should at least ask the, some questions about um, before it goes too far. And the second one was the copper boat paint. And for those of you who are in the boating world, you know that there have been some studies down, particularly in San Diego, suggesting that, that copper, the paint on boats is causing a lot of copper to be in the, the water column, and copper can be very devastating in a marine environment. The problem is that the study was based in Shelter Island and in one particular part which has absolutely no circulation. So again, we're dealing with an issue where it seems like there's some site specificity that needs to be considered that our harbor, uh, where we're not seeing any, we are seeing copper, but we aren't seeing the impacts, that again, to ask for a lot of uh, expense on the parts of individuals and a part of the city would have to monitor the program when we're not seeing any benefit necessarily from it. So I think that we can uh, write on that issue too and raise some issues that uh, should be addressed before it's enacted. Okay, and I have no uh, committee reports. So it's on to uh, public hearings. Before we begin public hearings, I'd like to see a little show of hands here. How many people in the audience are here for the Morningside Development Agreement item? I'm trying to say how many aren't. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots, okay. Um, uh, with Council's indulgement, indulgence, uh, I think I'd like to move that item, which is item number 27, up to be the first item under public hearings. We all set with that? Who's here for other items that don't want to wait through that? Yeah. yeah that's not fair, right? They promise not to talk a long time, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's Council's pleasure here? Do you want to uh, move ahead with Morningside or take the other items here? Yeah, Let, let's, let's do the normal routine. Uh, I'm for the normal. We have consultants All right. here and things like that, that. All right, we have a consensus to move on with the ordinary agenda. So uh, the first item is a T Mobile telecommunications permit. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll be recu recusing myself from this item. Okay. So, Mr. Mayor and Council members, this item is a, um, as you noted, a public hearing involving T Mobile telecommunications. Uh, the address is 2033 2311 Acacia in Santa Ana Heights. As is our typical process, we would offer a, a brief staff report. I believe um, uh, Kim Brant and then Jaime Murillo will discuss that. And there's an opportunity for the applicant to speak if needed, public comment, and then close the public okay. hearing. Are there a lot of changes from the first time around? Not that I know of. Yeah. I mean, if there does, aren't any does changes. Council, does council care to waive the report here? I say waive the report. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're I'll back move the here. action. Do you want to get going? Do we Let's have go. a second? Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Public comment on item number 24, T-Mobile Communications Permit. Do we have anyone that wishes to make a statement? Good evening. My name is Mandy Medina, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Acacia Plaza 2 Owners Association, Ms. Helen Rask, and Curtis Properties. This is the third proposed meeting that this matter has been brought before the council, and it should be known that although the applicant, T-Mobile and Trillium, was required to provide proof of approval and authority from Acacia Plaza 2 Owners Association to proceed with the permit or construction, they have not nor have ever received said authority to move forward. 
Although, this is the, although it is the requirement in the City of Newport Beach's permit process to prove that applicant received authorization for the structure, it needed to be voted upon and approved by the Association Board. However, applicant made no attempt to receive approval from Acacia Plaza 2 as relevant parties for this proposed new structure. If in fact applicant claims to have Acacia Plaza 2's permission, this statement is entirely false and fabricated. We can only guess that the applicant was hoping that the permit would be issued without full disclosure to all parties. The cell tower issue is, always, is and always was absolutely prohibited by the CCNRs governing these office buildings without express approval from the Board of Directors of the Acacia Plaza 2. Therefore, the Acacia Plaza 2 Board of Directors feel this aggressive and almost stealth permit application has been a great waste of the city's precious time and efforts. If the city allowed this permit to be approved, the relevant parties who I represent would be materially damaged in the following ways. One, the installation of the cell tower would cause negative alterations and changes in the appearance and architecture of our office buildings. It would spoil the cohesive appearance and defeat the purpose of the mutu mutually agreed association covenants, conditions, and restrictions. It should also be noted that the cell tower structure is also in violation of the CCNRs to which all building owners are bound and therefore legal process would follow to appeal and reverse the decision. Two, although it is our understanding federal law prohibits the city council from denying the permit on the basis of harmful radiation it will emit, we have substantial evidence that the fear and concern of the radiation on our property will drive renters from the buildings we own. We have already had a majority of our tenants voice their concern in this matter, therefore negatively impacting the success of our future business. Due to the nature of our clientele, they are especially hypersensitive to this environment and the approval of the application would be immensely detrimental to us and our business. In conclusion, Acacia Plaza has not nor ever will give T-Mobile permission to build a cell phone tower on our office building. Allowing T-Mobile and Trillium to obtain permission to construct said tower is in direct violation to Acacia Plaza 2 CCNRs. Although this permit would clearly generate revenue for the city of Newport Beach, due to the above material damages, we would sustain as citizens of Newport Beach and appeal to you to move to disapprove this permit and permanently remove this from your calendar. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other comment on this item? Public comment? While he's coming up, maybe the city attorney can comment on whether there's a requirement that we have to work it out. One of you, come on up. That, that we have to have pre-approval of the CCNRs or the HOA or we don't have to have pre-approval, but the permit is conditioned upon them getting them that approval. getting approval. Okay, so, so they can't start building until they get the approval of the, exactly. of the association. And do they have to document that to us in some form? They have to fulfill and. They have to establish that they uh, met all conditions to the permit before they can construct. Okay, so if they can't get the approval of their um, members, then they can't move forward. Exactly. Okay. And, and just any action the council takes tonight, if you approve the permit, does not compel the homeowners association, excuse me, the, the commercial association from, uh, doesn't compel them to actually approve it or anything. It doesn't. Right. They still the have their discretionary approval authority. Precisely. All we're doing is saying if you can get it, then you can build it. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. But but under the if we do approve this, they could, for example, submit uh, building plans and so forth, right? To us. To yes, us. But they would not have an issued permit to go proceed unless they've met all their conditions. Right. And to meet their conditions, they need to get the approval of the association. Thus, wasting staff time working on plans and uh, approvals. The the problem that we're faced with is is that. The application is consistent with our general plan and consistent with our regulations, and we have uh, federal communications issues that deals with we need to tr try to expedite these issues. So it, it's our preference in light of the federal communications issues that we proceed forward, and that's why we've recommended approving the permit conditioned upon uh, not being able to construct unless they have the approval of the association. Council Member Sally? And why are we... Uh conditioning this permit uh, to get the uh, HOA or the association approval on it when our other HOAs, we don't, if you have a single family home, for example, it has to go in front of the planning commission, we don't condition those approvals on getting HOA approval. In fact, we've consistently stayed out of that business. Which is where I would like to be as well. Uh, however, it's my understanding that the ordinance and our regulations require that to be the case. So this is a unique ordinance? Yes, it is. 
Okay. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Tim Miller. I'm with uh, Trailing Consulting uh, for T-Mobile. Um, actually, my my, I was just cleared up there on what was going on here. We are trying to work with the association. Um, what we did here, we applied for the permit. We were getting to go here. We didn't realize that the property owner that we're working with didn't contact the association at that time. So that's why we're here we are today. But uh, T-Mobile would still like to go through with the land use approval and uh, continue on and try to sign some kind of common ground with the association. So that's why we asked for your approval tonight. And you won't be wasting our time with building plans and submitting applications for no, things it is, without it, that. No, it is because this came at so late in the point after we were scheduled for the uh, before city council. Yes. Okay. Do, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments on this item? <coughs> Mayor Hanna, members of the council, as you know, my name is Jim Mosher. Um, Uh, given the recent publicity as to how prolonged use of even cell phone handsets might increase the risk of cancer and past concerns about the aesthetics of the next G proposal in Corona Del Mar, I think this council must understand our community is quite sensitive to the way in which cell phone transmission equipment is deployed among us, just as we are quite sensitive to group homes being properly placed and managed. Um, I have to echo Mandy's comments, um, and as I said when this was being continued at the previous meeting, we really need to change the procedure so that you direct the staff to do more community outreach very early in the application process. In this case, if planning would very rapidly have discovered that the building owners were never under any circumstances going to authorize this project. They could have gone back to T-Mobile's deployment agent and said, hey, you're wasting our time, you're going to be wasting the council's time, and you're even wasting T-Mobile's time and money. Why don't you look for a different solution? However, the matter is before you. Uh, to approve it, you have to make two findings according to the staff report, and I don't think you can make either of those findings. Uh, you have to consider you have the business people of your community here objecting to this. You have nobody clamoring for it. The first finding you have to make is that T-Mobile needs this exact facility to provide adequate service, and that's simply rubbish. They provide you in this pictures of what the facility will look like. They don't explain why they need the facility. I looked in Jaime's uh, planning file and I saw the coverage maps. They show an area of lower than normal but still workable coverage not here, but over between Birch Street and Jamboree in the Santa Ana Heights residential area. And if you look at the aerial photos here, you'll see that area between Acacia Street, well, I, they're in your report here, there's aerial photos, the whole area between Acacia Street, actually between Irvine Avenue and Birch Street is just populated with many, many buildings. Uh, this consulting agency, Trillium, found the first willing property owner, uh, there's no evidence that they consulted all, I don't think once they found a willing owner who actually didn't have authority that they actually diligently looked at these other possible sites, some of which might have allowed the antennas to be put in in a le less intrusive way and closer to the area where they had the problem. Um, and then the second finding, which was already addressed, is you have to find that this is going to have no materially detrimental effect on the neighboring businesses and property owners. And they're here testifying it is going to have a material uh, detriment to their business. It's going to drive out clients who have fears of these antennas. Whether the fears are correct or not, it's going to cause them to lose business. And I know you're very much pro-business, and I think you should be making a decision that favors our local business, not some international. Actually, T-Mobile is based in Germany now. I don't think you should be acting in their favor rather than that of our local business owners. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Do we have any other comments on this agenda item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to council. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further? Council Member Curry, did you have a comment? Well, I, I would just uh, say, well, I don't put a lot of stock in the um, safety issues here. I mean, this is the third time it's come before us. So we've had six weeks now. My sense of it is if T-Mobile was going to negotiate with the, with the uh, property association that they would have done so. And it seems to me that there's not really an effort going on to do that. And we're being 
brought into a dispute between private parties where they appear to have irreconcilable differences, and I think we're trying to be used to log rule this, this decision locally, and I just don't think that that ought to be the role of the city until they get their uh, uh, property approvals in order, then it's appropriate for us to consider this approval, so I'll be opposing this. As will I. I'd, I'd like more clarity from the city attorney about this. Are you suggesting to us that as a matter of law, we should we have no basis to not proceed on this item? If I could have, I haven't done the actual planning analysis with respect to this issue. And if I could ask staff to address that question as to exactly where we are regarding the planning analysis. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, members of the council. Um, Mr. Moser is correct. There's two required findings that the council must make in order to approve the telecom facility. In this case, it's to allow it to exceed the uh, established height limit for this area of 37 feet. Uh, the proposed facility exceeds the height limit by 3 feet 10 inches uh, with, the th with the screening enclosure and the, uh, the tile roof element. Uh, the facts that support the finding have been included in the resolution. Uh, with respect to the need for the telecom facility, uh, the applicant has submitted documentation in the form of coverage maps that do show that there is a need to uh, provide the antennas at this facility uh, within this section of the city to uh, enhance coverage in the area and close significant gaps that they have shown on the maps. Um, they have also indicated that they have um, approached other property owners within the area on facilities that their RF engineer has indicated could provide uh, the, I guess, um, coverage that they're seeking. And they have not been able to uh, get property owner approval to install the facilities on those buildings. Uh, the only other alternative would be to construct a freestanding uh, telecom facility, which is not high on our city's priority list, and therefore this is the best uh, location for the antennas in this part of the city. I, I believe what you're being told, and I, and I frankly agree with the staff's analysis, that as long as all of our conditions are met, in other words, that the application actually meets the conditions, so that it's consistent with our planning regulations, and in fact, evidence has been submitted which establishes a need for the facility, then it's always risky to, in a telecommunication situation, to go against it when you don't have evidence in the record that is actually establishing a lack of need for the facility. Where telecommunications issues get particularly complex is when you start finding yourself litigating with a carrier about whether, in fact, there's a need. I would actually prefer not to get involved in that type of litigation. So absent some clear evidence in the record, I would recommend not relying on a, a contrary finding since we have evidence in the record that supports the need. Whether it's in fact needs to be on this particular location or not, there's also evidence in the record as described by the planning staff that at least submitted by the applicant that they have made attempts to go elsewhere. They've got approval of a landlord. So consistent with our regulations that so long as all of our requirements are met, it's best for us to actually approve and then let the other folks work it out. Uh, I, I understand Council Member Curry's concern and I, and I recognize that. And the, um, our approval does not bind the association in any way. What it does is it gets us out of the middle, frankly. And it's my preference that we not be in the middle of a telecommunications argument. That's why I'm making the recommendation that if you come to the conclusion that the findings as recommended by staff can be made that conditioned upon obtaining the approval of the association that the council proceed forward <coughs> consistent with its regulations and, and authorize the issuance of this permit. Okay, Council Member Curry. Well, I just find that somewhat circular because we say that one of our conditions is they have to have the, the approval of the CCNRs and the appropriate association, which they apparently don't have, and we condition our approval on that, then, then we're saying that, uh, that then we're not in the middle of it. But, I mean, we're, we're, we basically said they don't meet the conditions that we would have for the approval by that definition. They currently do not satisfy that condition. That right. Is absolutely. Exactly true. right. We, and there were, I think they're asking for city approval so they can try and use that as leverage uh, with their with their adjoining property owners here, and puts us right smack in the middle, frankly, of a situation I think of a dispute between these property owners. 
you know, they could no more say that they want to put it on my house if I didn't agree to it, and then we could approve it and tell them to go work it out with me. I mean, I think that's what we're doing here. I respect your, your position, Council Member. You certainly have the authority in your position. Council Member Selich. Yeah, well, I don't see where that's putting, um, putting us um, in, in the position of jeopardy. The, the association is free to approve or disapprove it. Um, I agree with the city attorney that us approving this application gets us out of the middle of it. Let T-Mobile and the association work it out. If they don't get their permit from the association, it's, it's, it's over. And clearly, it cannot be constructed without the association's approval. Yes. Okay. Do we have any other comment here from Council? I would just like to uh, make a comment on a comment you made, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no one is allowed to submit plans to the city without a check, uh, so we're not wasting city money. We're funding city time. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, absent any further discussion, please vote. For item 24, there's a resolution, resolution number 2011-52, a <laughs> resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach approving application number TP 2011-005 for a telecom permit located at 20311 Acacia Street. With Mayor Pro Tem Gardner and Council Member Curry voting no, the motion carries and Council Member Daigle recused herself. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the 2010 Urban Water Management Plan. Do we have a staff report on this? We don't need a staff report. This is a public hearing. If the council desires one, both uh, George Murdoch, uh, our utilities general manager, is here, as well as the consultant that prepared the UWMP. Usually, Council Mayor, Mayor Protem Gardner has questions. <laughs> no, I don't actually don't All have right. any questions. I would say it's interesting. I think that a lot of uh, what the Met does and everything is smoke and mirrors. Um, I think it's highly questionable some of the conclusions they're drawing because they're, they're saying that we're going to have all these things built and the delta is going to be fixed and all that. But I will say kudos to our staff. Our staff has done everything it can do to make Newport Beach as independent as possible in terms of its water supply. And for that reason alone, this is a, a, an excellent plan. That I know there's been a lot of time and effort gone into it. So good work, George. I take it. I take it council is okay to waive a staff report on this item. And I'll move the action. All right, we have a motion. Second, council member Selich. Uh, do we have public comment on this item? My name is Jim Mosier. I'll try to be extremely brief because I know all the people are waiting here. It's probably just a typo, but I was surprised to see on page 2-3 of the report that it says that this council, in its efforts to conserve water, had recently approved the development on Banning Ranch of 1,375 homes, 75 resort hotel rooms, and 75,000 square feet of commercial space, adding 614 acre feet of demand to our already extremely stretched water supply. I think it's a typo, but the, the recent approval by this council was a surprise to me. Surprised me too. Actually, <laughs> there must be two versions out there because I looked at this in the draft form and I said that's not correct. So there is a different version of this plan that said we've not approved it because it's very clear that we've not approved it. So um, with that amendment, um, I would offer. I'll amend my motion yeah, to thank say you. that we have not approved the Bounty Ranch development. To kill these drafts somewhere and that's bury right. them before <laughs> they reappear. Okay. Old, old drafts never die. They just. Do we, do we have any other public comment on this item? Okay, hearing none, please vote. Item 25 has a resolution, resolution number 2011-53, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach adopting the 2010 Urban Water Management Plan. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, on to item number 26, uh, which I guess we intend to continue. So, uh, Dave, did you have any comment to make at this point? No, the request is indeed to continue that to the 28th. All right, do I hear a motion Move to continue action. this? To continue. Second. Motion and a second to continue the item. Is there any public comment on item number 26, which has to do with Violito amendments, general plan amendments? Okay, I see no public comment. Any further comment from council? Nancy, you have your light on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, no further comments. Please vote. 
Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we are now on to item number 27. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, this is the public hearing that involves a periodic review of the, of the compliance by Morningside Recovery with the Zoning Implementation and Public Benefit Agreement. As we've just been going through a number of public hearings, we will spend more time on this one. Um, it'll start with a staff presentation, and then uh, typically the applicant has an opportunity, in this case Morningside, to come up and uh, rebut or comment on any findings that the staff has made. Um, then it's typically open to the public. Um, and then typically the, the applicant has a chance to come back and rebut something. Um, and then uh, the council is free to make a recommendation. I'm going to introduce uh, Kim Brandt to uh, start this process. All right, before we do that, uh, how many people in the audience intend to make comments on this item? Okay. Well, what's the pleasure of council? Did you wish to restrict public comment to three minutes on this item? Uh, yeah, I think so. Is that the consensus? All right, so public comment will be restricted to three minutes each on this item. Um, and I would like to, I understand this item evokes passion and uh, there are a lot of committed people in the audience here this evening. I would like to encourage uh, all the members of the audience to observe appropriate decorum uh, which includes refraining from clapping um, and applause and hoots and catcalls as well. So uh, can we please, and, and that includes council members. Can we just like do it all at once right up at the beginning, like so, a minute of hooting and catcalling? No, then. no, no, no. no? Okay. Come Sorry. on, council member uh, Rosansky, let's, uh, all right. So with that admonishment, uh, we'll begin with the staff report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Associate Planner Janet Brown will give an overview of the staff report and then it will be available for questions at the completion. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. The zoning agreement between the City of Newport Beach and Morningside was adopted by ordinance on September 28, 2010. The agreement provides Morningside with entitlement for the operation of residential care facilities in the city. It also establishes the terms and operational conditions with which the city and Morningside are required to comply. And it provides for a periodic compliance review once at least every 12 months to determine whether or not Morningside is in compliance with the terms and operational conditions of the agreement. Morningside currently operates facilities in these the following locations. The first one is here at 4823 A and B River Avenue it's a duplex and they occupy both units. They occupy a single unit here at 29 Imaloa Court in the Newport Crest condominium development. And here at uh, 100 and 102 Via Antibes and 208 Via Lido Sud, they occupy a triplex, all three units. And then at 533 Via Lido Sud, they occupy a single family home. Some of the key operational conditions of the zoning agreement are condition number one, the occupancy level is limited to 36 client or client beds citywide with no more than 30 in the peninsula zone. Condition number seven regarding smoking and tobacco products requires that secondhand smoke may not be detected off site and the littering of cigarette butts is prohibited. Condition number eight regarding parkings requires that garages and other parking spaces must be available at all times for the parking of Morningside's vehicles by their staffs, clients, and visitors. Condition number nine regarding client transport requires that van drivers are required to respect all city rules with regards to parking, loading and unloading of passengers, and stopping in traffic lanes, for example. Condition number 12 requires that quiet hours be observed between the hours of 9 p.m. and 8 a.m. by the Morningside clients and their staff. Since the zoning agreement was adopted, staff has investigated numerous complaints regarding alleged violations of the operational conditions at each of the Morningside facilities. Staffs conducted a thorough review of Morningside's operations and requirements of the agreement, and through the review process, including interior and exterior inspections by our Code Enforcement Division, we have identified a significant pattern of repeated violations. 
based on our review, it appears Morningside is unable or unwilling to comply with the terms of the agreement and responsibly manage its facilities. First violation that was issued to Morningside occurred on October 15th for failure to provide accessible parking in a garage space. Then in November, the city issued four notices of violation to Morningside. Uh, the first was for failure to comply with condition number one related to the occupancy. Through on-site inspections, we determined that they had exceeded the occupancy limits in the peninsula zone. Quickly after notifying no, uh, Morningside, they did reduce the occupancy and we have confirmed that they're occupied at the allowed level today. We also issued notices of violation at two different locations related to parking and a notice of violation for um, the loading and unloading of passengers with the transport van condition number nine and failure to adhere to the route plans condition number 13. In early December, the city met with representatives of Morningside to discuss some of these complaints received in addition to some other matters. Morningside's representative stated that they would address the issues with their staff. In a good faith effort to work with Morningside to attain compliance with the zoning agreement, our code enforcement officer has met with Morningside representatives numerous times, and in many cases, they've sent emails or letters to warn about complaints of repeated violations prior to issuing either a notice of violation or an administrative citation. Although Morningside has assured us that they've addressed the issues with their staff, the city continues to receive complaints for repeated violations. Subsequent to publication of the staff report in response to some additional complaints received, the Code Enforcement Division did issue some additional notices of violation and administrative citations that aren't reflected in the staff report. The following represents all of the notices of violation or administrative citations that have been issued to Morningside between September 28th and June 10th for failing to comply. First, with condition number one related to occupancy, we've issued one notice of violation. With relation to condition number six, we've issued two notices of violation. Condition number seven related to smoking, two notices of violation have been issued and one administrative citation. Condition number eight related to parking, four notices of a violation have been issued. Condition number nine related to client transport, four notices of violation and five administrative uh, citations have been issued. Condition number 12 related to quiet hours, two notices of violation and two notices of administrative citation. Condition number 13 related to route plans, one notice of violation. Condition number 14 related to deliveries, two notices of violation, excuse me, one notice of violation and two notices of administrative citation. And condition number 22 related to compliance with all local, state, and federal laws, one notice of violation, four administrative citation. And lastly, uh, section N of the zoning agreement requires that Morningside provide compliance review reports quarterly. We've issued one notice of violation. So in the eight months that the uh, zoning agreement has been, since it's been adopted, we have issued a total of 19 notices of violation and 14 administrative citation. At this time, staff also believes that Morningside has failed to comply with condition number 15, which requires that Morningside establish a 24 hour hotline to which inquiries or complaints may be made regarding their facilities. And this information is required to be provided to the city as well as the public. In the alternative, Morningside is required to provide area residents in the city with a contact name, phone number, and email address to which inquiries or complaints may be addressed. While they have not provided us with a phone number, they did recently provide us with an email address, which is shown here on the screen, brian at morningsiderecovery.com, where complaints may be <coughs> registered directly with Morningside. Persons wishing to uh, register complaints with the city may do so by calling our code enforcement division at 949-644-3215. We've also received a number of complaints regarding Morningside's activities in the Lido Marina Village. They occupy three different uh, locations here. Um, 
this is where Morningside's administrative offices are located, and it is also where they conduct individual and group therapy sessions for their clients, as well as intake evaluation, psychological testing, and medical assessment. Although the uses in this area are not directly addressed in the zoning agreement, they are subject to the rules and regulations of our municipal code. And further, operational number 22 of the zoning agreement does require compliance with all state, local, and federal laws. The city has been engaged in a series of ongoing dialogue with Morningside regarding the uses in this area, what's allowed versus what is not allowed. And in May, as Mr. Hunt reported, we issued a letter to Morningside requiring that they cease the disallowed uses within 30 days. That period did expire on Sunday. This afternoon, we did receive a written response from Morningside, which is currently being reviewed by our staff in the Community Development Department. In the meantime, code enforcement has requested to schedule an inspection of each of the properties to determine what, if any, changes have been made by Morningside to date. Reaching a conclusion on this outstanding matter is a priority to which staff is committed. In conclusion, the purpose of tonight's hearing is for City Council to determine whether Morningside has demonstrated good faith compliance with the terms and conditions of the zoning agreement. Based on our review and the information presented tonight, staff does not believe that Morningside has made good faith efforts to comply. Staff recommends that City Council determine Morningside is unable or unwilling to comply with the zoning agreement and adopt a resolution finding that Morningside has not demonstrated good faith compliance with the agreement. And finally, we would ask that City Council direct staff to issue a written notice to Morningside describing the areas in which they have failed to comply and the steps they must take to reach compliance. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Do we have questions or comments here from Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner? Um, I, well, I think it's uh, fairly, <sighs> I would have to agree, I would say, with, with at least what I've heard so far from the staff. Um, one thing struck me, I mean, some of these things you go, okay, you know, you're trying to put yourself in the other person's position and maybe they don't have as much control over staff as they should or this or that. <laughs> but the fact that, that they can't even give us a 24-hour phone number. I mean, that's so basic. That's a matter of picking up the phone and calling and saying, here, for each of our units, or this is our one person that you call. That to me was just, uh, I don't know, it smacked almost of arrogance of just, hey, we don't have to pay any attention to this. So I, I, if the uh, morning five representatives are here, I'd sort of like to know why. Is there, was there some issue about that that we're not aware of that maybe it's not quite as flagrant as it seems, but that, that did particularly strike me. Council Member Curry. I'd like to ask the city attorney, assuming that we make the findings as outlined by staff uh, in accordance with this hearing, what does that then do in terms of the practicable impact or effect of, of abating these issues in the community? Currently, pursuant to the zoning agreement, we have the responsibility under the zoning agreement to give notice to Morningside and allow them a 30-day cure period. That's expressly within the zoning agreement. So. Uh, the notice would be given to them outlining what has happened and giving the steps necessary to take, um, to move toward resolution of the violations. Um, th they have 30 days to cure. If they have achieved cure and there have been no ongoing violations, uh, we will report that back to the council. We'll, we'll come back and report period to the council regarding how that 30 day cure period went. Uh, the ongoing issues related to this matter is, is that as identified by staff, we have a significant pattern of ongoing or repeated types of violations. The cure will not only have to remain uh, repaired, if I may, during that 30 days, but will need to remain repaired So, for the balance of the use of the agreement. We shouldn't go into another situation where we have a substantial pattern of repeat violations. So the council will receive a report back in 30 days, and if they have been functioning consistently with the zoning agreement, we'll cause one thing to happen, and if they have not, then it will cause another recommendation on our part. Okay, and so uh, uh, we need to follow the terms of the zoning agreement then in terms of this cure period. Is that the uh, appropriate steps? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. In my legal opinion, we have to follow the agreement, um, and I, it's appropriate to do so. And the agreement is expressed on giving a 30-day notice, a notice and a cure period of 30 days. Yeah. Because otherwise, from a purely intuitive standpoint, one might wonder why we wouldn't just go straight to a recommendation to terminate the agreement. But uh, 
apparently we are required by the terms of the agreement to we go forward. We are required by the terms of the agreement. Notes. Okay. Okay. Do we have any other uh, comments by council members, questions of staff? All right. Then we'll open the public hearing. We ordinarily start that with the offering the um, the um, applicant here the opportunity to make a statement. Good morning, I'm Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, my name is Mary Helen Beata Ficado, and I'm um, one of the council representing Morningside Recovery. Excuse me, Mary Helen, before you begin, uh, I did want to make it clear we ordinarily allow flexibility on behalf of the applicant to exceed the three minute time limit. So, um, can, do you, will you be exceeding that limit? And uh, I don't believe so, but I don't want you to hold me to it either. That's um, fine. That's fine. But I, I, I just want everybody to understand that we offer applicants that flexibility, so please go ahead with your... Uh, I, I will say that I, my intent is not to get up here and address every one of these alleged violations and tell you that they didn't happen or, or what we did. I think there's a summary there. What I will... Um, I do want to start off with um, Council Member Gardner's um, inquiry about the hotline um, number. Um, the staff report summarizes the conditions, the operational conditions and the zoning agreement. Um, and those summaries are not entirely accurate. And with respect to the um, hotline, it's, com it's not accurate. Um, and that is that Morningside Recovery is not obligated under the zoning agreement to establish a 24-hour hotline. In fact, while it does talk about a 24-hour hotline, it goes on to say that alternatively, which in its most common sense means instead of establishing the hotline number that Morningside can provide um, a name and an email address by which complaints can be addressed. Morningside from the very beginning provided that email address. In fact, over the course of the eight months um, since the zoning agreement was um, adopted, we've received numerous um, emails from code enforcement regarding each and every complaint just as it was made. So there was not even a finding that in fact those complaints were real but that if it was only that somebody had made a complaint, and so we were sent notice of that. Many of those emails I was either copied directly on or it was forwarded to me so that I would be aware of that. Um, so to answer your question, um, no, we are not, it's not arrogance. We didn't, we're required to do something and we're just flat out saying we don't care. Um, we believe that we are in compliance with that term of the zoning agreement. In fact, I've had numerous discussions with and the city over the um, past week or so regarding this condition. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to address was there was a mention in the staff report about parolees and probationers and Morningside Recovery agreed that it would not um, violate what provision of the municipal code with regards to housing parolees and pro probationers. Um, and we have been at all times compliant with that. I'm very surprised in reading this only because the city's communicated with me on numerous occasions um, about things that needed to be addressed that the police department for Newport Beach has refused to give them those updates as to whether there are parolees or probationers being housed um, here in Newport at one of Morningside's facilities. Um, to the extent, again, this has been our position all along. There are a lot of things, and I've expressed this to the city, that the zoning agreement does not require Morningside to do. But in the interest of complying in good faith with the zoning agreement, with getting along and having an ongoing relationship with the city of Newport Beach and the residents of Newport Beach, um, we are willing to go a step beyond what's required. And that would include giving updated reports on this parolee or probationers, even though it's not required under the zoning agreement. Um, another thing I wanted to address was the secondhand smoke. Again, I told you that in the zoning, in the staff report, it summarizes some of the conditions. With regards to smoking, when we were in negotiations over the zoning agreement, we talked about smoking and the potential for having disagreement on how do you contain smoke. It's like when you go to a, a casino and they have, this is the non-smoking section, the smoke doesn't tend to stay in the non-smoking, in the smoking section. It kind of lingers and goes other places. Um, and this is why there was a provision added that said, Morningside shall demonstrate good faith compliance with this provision. 
and it has. For example, even though we don't believe we're required to do it, with respect to 29 Imaloa, we moved, because of complaints that we received, we moved the smoking location to a designated place within the property line so as to provide the least amount of interference with the neighbors. With respect to 533 Vialito Sud, um, yeah, with respect to 533 Vialito Sud, we've moved the smoking into the garage um, so that we're not affecting some of the neighbors because we were receiving numerous complaints from the city that they had received from residents. Um, as you go through the staff report, you can see that a lot of the complaints that have been received have been with respect to the 533 Vialito Sud property. And I think it's because um, that's what most of the people here tonight are probably here for because of that 533 property. Overall, the biggest thing that I think is not working with the zoning agreement is that citations are being issued, and this is why I'm not going to go one by one, citations are being issued to Morningside every time the city receives a complaint about something, even without in doing any sort of investigation into that. And I want to give you two examples of something that just came up recently. We received a, a communication from the city that Morningside was in violation of the deliveries, of not receiving deliveries after 5 o'clock p.m. And the reason we were, received that communication was because somebody was seen coming into Morningside at around 8 o'clock at night with an envelope in their hand. And they went into the house, and when they came out, they didn't have the envelope. Again, clearly, if you read the provisions of the zoning agreement, we're not in violation of having deliveries after 5 o'clock. Another thing was we received a communication about gate noise, that the gate at 533 Vialito sued was making noise, and so we were in violation of the quiet hours. These are the kind of things. So again, I'm not going to address every violation, but I will tell you that to say that, and I think I summarized it, um, to say that there were 19 notices of violations and 14 administrative citations without any investigation as to whether, in fact, there were violations of the operational conditions, I, I think is a misstatement. Um, Morningside is demonstrating good faith compliance. <clears throat> so unless you have specific questions about things. Um, I do. Okay. Um, I have a, uh, if I may, uh, as you pointed out, uh, the hotline is, according to the letter to the law, is not an agreement. And so I understand you have to get your legal points on the record. My role is political, and it seems to me that if your company had more good faith, we wouldn't be here tonight, and you know, plopping one of these homes right in the middle of a residential area, that's not good faith, that's bad judgment. And so what can you do as a corporation to fundamentally provide good faith to our community? I, I guess I, I disagree with you because I think what you're taking issue with is the fact that we've established one of our facilities at 533 Vialito Sud, which I don't really think is what we're trying to address here tonight. Morningside, for their own reasons, has picked the locations of where their facilities are going to be. And because the people that live within our facilities operate much like the family that most of you might have, a single housekeeping unit, um, we don't think that's bad judgment that we've picked 533. That we've well, picked I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to argue with you on uh, legal points. Uh, I'm saying in terms of good faith with our community, what you've done is obviously upsetting. If it's your intention to have good faith with our community, I just think you need to evaluate your reevaluate your business decisions. And, and your your point is noted. Um, I guess what what I disagree with is I think Morningside has demonstrated good faith compliance. If what you're saying is unless we move our 533 Via Lido property, then we're not demonstrating good faith compliance. Then if that's the standard we're going to use, then I, I guess I would have to agree with you because 533 Via Lido sued is still there and. The plan is for it to stay. Council Member Rosansky? Yeah, just going back to the hotline issue, I'm looking at the operational conditions, Exhibit 1 to the development agreement, or the okay. zoning agreement. It says here that you're to maintain a, a hot, or provide public notice of and operate a hotline for receiving inquiries and or complaints in reference to the operation of the facility, the number need not be staffed 24 hours a day or seven days a week. So do you have you complied with that? Or with respect to the phone number? I'm saying, do you provide a hotline that's been? 
Yeah, and let provide me, a public notice of the of the number. Our, our telephones, just as a side note, our telephones are staffed 24 hours a day. If you call Morningside, you will get somebody to answer 24 hours. So a that day. that's your hotline number. Well, then? so what I what I was saying is that if you keep reading on that provision, yeah, I'm going to get to that. After you get there, it says alternatively, which means that instead of right. Here's the, another choice. That well, let me finish then. Alternatively, the operator shall provide area residents and the city with a contact name, which I guess you did, a phone number and, not or, and right. an email address. So I guess, did you provide the phone number for the contact name and the email address? It was Brian. At yes, it's, it's Morningside's number. Okay, so. And that's the number that. All right. Uh, so, Janet, is that not? In compliance with the development agreement or or the zoning agreement prior to this evening or um, we had not received a phone number we were given Brian Burke's email address but I have not been given a phone number okay so is this are we talking about a miscommunication here she's saying that their Morningside number is Brian's number and you're saying well they didn't tell you officially Morningside's number is Brian's number so they didn't, are not in compliance is that what you're saying Janet that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have I have a did you want to say something else, Janet? That phone number should also be made available to the public so that they can make those phone calls if they need to. Okay. All right. I, I have a question. With regard to the establishment of five thirty three via uh, via Lido's, uh, via sued, uh, was that was the occupancy of that uh, location established in accordance with the zoning agreement? Uh, I guess my question is of the city attorney or the city manager. That, that location was occupied before the actual effective date per se of the zoning agreement. However, with respect to the operational conditions and their effectiveness, it was established at a time where they were in a place and they had the right to relocate consistent with the operational conditions in the zoning agreement pursuant to the settlement agreement that was entered into in April. So that location at the time it was actually created was consistent with uh, consistent with the operational conditions and the settlement agreement and ultimately the zoning agreement. But it was occupied prior to its authorized date to be occupied under the zoning agreement. It was yes it was author prior to the actual date under the zoning agreement however under the settlement agreement which predated the zoning agreement that had an attached amount attachment with the operational conditions the settlement agreement said the operational conditions shall take will be in effect prior to the effective date of the zoning agreement the operational conditions allowed for morningside to reestablish or establish locations so long as they met with the dispersal requirements of the operational conditions. So while the zoning agreement was not in effect at the time that Morningside located at 533 Villalito sued, the operational conditions under the settlement agreement were. You know, I, I, I guess I still regard that as not a demonstration of good faith in terms of the agreement uh, to gun jump on that location. Um, and so I don't regard that as a trivial matter. And then uh, one of the citations was for violation of the maximum occupancies. That's certainly not a trivial matter. So uh, I guess I, I don't understand the idea that these violations of the agreement are trivial. Mayor, may I address those? With regards to the, re the location of the 533 property, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but Morningside actually cleared the location of that property prior to moving into that property. And I've seen email correspondence with the city where the city was given locations of where Morningside was thinking about moving, and 533 Sud was on those, and we received communication back saying that that was okay. So, so to say that Morningside didn't act in good faith in, in moving to that location, I don't think is entirely correct. I don't think it's correct at all. With respect to the maximum occupancy levels, um, Morningside has never exceeded the bed caps. Um, we did have a miss, what I believe to be a miscommunication at the very beginning, and it had to do with we were in the process of moving facilities, and we still had beds, actual beds, that if you went and you just counted the beds, you would think that we were in violation of the, the bed cap. 
in order to clear up that confusion, as soon as that was brought to our attention and began to be made an issue of, we removed those extra beds. And, and that's why it was cleared up. But, but we have never at any point exceeded the caps that we had agreed to. Does the city manager wish to say anything regarding this, those comments? I do. I do. Um, a fairly common misconception. And, and uh, my discussion with your previous executive director, who's now no longer there, Ms. Bruce, about the three, I, w I was, this was right after the settlement agreement was executed as the zoning agreement was going forward. It was, at some point, we will move the facility at 40th, sorry, 39th Street. Um, we're looking at these three properties. Uh, one of the properties was 533 Via Lita Sued. I was asked if these meet the criteria for within the zone agreement to be distant enough from other facilities. I said that they do meet the criteria. Um, I was not aware at all that the, the lease would be executed within days or weeks. I'd assume that your client would have known when the settlement agreement, sorry, when the zone agreement took effect. And I also remember telling the executive director that, you know what, there, is a couple, there are a couple of properties on there which I just don't think are compatible with, um, with this type of use. And one of them was the 533 sued was, sued property. She apparently took that into consideration, may have discussed that back with um, the owners of Morningside, and they decided to go ahead and do that anyway. At no point did I say, you're clear to go, you're clear to move. Um, these were just in terms of do they meet the requirements, the distancing requirements of the zoning agreement. Okay. Councilman Rosansky. Oh. Oh, just come back to me, please. Okay. Do we have any other comments or questions uh, of the applicant here? I don't know my question now. So I'm back to you. Yeah. The, the applicant uh, stated that she felt that most of these um, citations and violations related to the to the one property the 533 property can, can you do you have any idea what the distribution is or something is that a, an accurate statement or not an accurate statement um, yes if you take a look at handwritten page number six of the staff report I've got a chart broken down um, by address facility address where I list the number of violations per address and I would say certainly all of the warnings, email warnings and letters that we had sent to Morningside were reflective of the 533 Bialito sued. Um, there are other addresses where we had more notices of violation issued, but I say that a great deal of activity and time spent by code enforcement is at that address. Mm -hmm. But there are f at least five general not operational matters that tend to specifically involve any address, is that correct? And then it looks like s eight that involve other addresses, actually more at the Fort 4823 River than at even the 533 Vila Sud. Looks like that's... that's the, the general operational matters had to do with the um, transport bans, uh, generally driving in the city and not adhering to their route plan. I, I understand so I that. Pin I'm, that. I'm saying that River the Avenue. applicant's claim was that most of these violations, NOVs and administrative sites, involve 533 Violito suit. And I guess what I'm trying to establish is that a correct statement or not a correct statement, in your They're opinion? They're spread amongst all the facilities. Okay. So, I mean, uh, the table I'm looking at, it looks like 533 Violito suit has four notices of violation and three administrative sites, but 4823 River has six notices of violation and four sites and two parking citations, right? That's, yes, that's correct. And then, and then there's five notices of violations and one administrative citation that doesn't involve any particular property, just other operational characteristics of the business. Correct. So, and, and then there's two other columns and so if you look at the first one, 11 email warnings, Ray, all of those conditions that related to 533. Then the next one is four of the notices of violations. And then if you go to administrative citations, there was nine total. Three of them um, were over at 533 uh, via Lido sued. 
Yeah, but four and of I them were at 40. I'm just one third you're, of the NOVs were at the river property. But I mean, you're claiming that most of the hullabaloo here involves the one property, which I agree. A lot of these people are probably here for for that right. property. But I, based upon this chart here, unless you're telling me the chart's not accurate, I would say that that statement is not your statement is not accurate. I, I, I have not um, made up that chart, but I think. Uh, even Ms. Brown just said most of the efforts that's been spent by code enforcement has related to the 533 property. Well, a lot of the and efforts, but we're that. here really looking at the notices of violation and the citations. I mean, email warnings and this and that, you know, I agree. You know, we're calling you up on the phone saying, hey, you're being bad people today. You need to do something different. Uh, I'm not so concerned about that. I'm looking at the official, to me, these are the official actions of the city. Issuing a notice of violation or issuing a citation is a, yeah, I guess, um, Ms. Brown, I guess this question would be for you. What about, I mean, we've received um, citations for, like, double parking and that. Would that be under that general category as opposed to the 533? There are only two parking citations noted here because it was specific to some um, administrative citations that were issued on the, at the same time. There is another chart in the report where we do list the parking violations, and that's on handwritten page 9. Um, there's just four instances of parking violations during the period of the agreement. So they are listed in a separate chart. Okay. All right. I'd, I'd like to come back to this issue of the citations. Uh, Ms. Beatificato uh, also implied that we don't do, we, we, we don't routinely validate these complaints that they are sort of where the city's just sort of a hollow pipe. and. You know, it's the complaints yelled into one end and it comes out the other. Um, I'd like to hear the city manager comment on what our typical activity is in terms of investigating complaints and issuing citations, et cetera. The typical process is a fairly extensive uh, investigation and extensive in terms of code enforcement. The senior code enforcement officer, Matt Cozy Lyon, is here. He could probably explain how that typical process works. Um, we don't, we do not, we cannot, we will not just send out an NOV based on someone's phone call or email. It takes a follow-up investigation. It's taken very seriously by a very professional staff. And if I may address that, Mr. Mayor, uh, our office has been involved in all of the investigation with respect to these issues, either Ms. Walcott or Mr. Rowan of our office and myself. Uh, if Mr. Cozyline could address that particular allegation, he's here and it might be helpful. Uh, Matt, could you come forward just quickly? Ms. Beatificato has raised an issue as to whether or not we actually have conducted investigations prior to our notices of violations or our administrative citations. Could you address that issue? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. As the city manager Dave Kiss said, um, prior to issuing an administrative citation, we do a pretty thorough uh, investigation with the assistance of the city attorney's office to make sure that when we issue a citation that if the citation is appealed that we have the evidence to support um, issuing that administrative citation. So it's, it's not just a complaint is received and then we whip out a citation. There's a, there's a thorough investigation involved, um, analyzing all the facts, all the circumstances, and then a citation is issued if, if the evidence warrants that. All right, uh, do we have any other questions of the applicant here? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, We'll open uh, public comment to others, and I thought I would invite uh, Joel Slutsky up on behalf of the Morin organization here to make some comments to start off. And then we'll throw it open to others, anyone who wishes to make a comment. Yeah, I'm Joel Slutsky, uh, Morin, uh, maintain our residential neighborhood. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I'd like to say we appreciate what the city put out as far as the information. 300 pages or nearly 300 pages of violations was interesting to us because we don't get to see them all. And so we had a chance to sit down and read and understand what's going on. We're very concerned, however, about the fact that as we read these things, we see warning after warning after warning. This is going for eight months. I can't count how many times that Morningside's received a warning and there's nothing being done. So it's very important for us to see this come to some, co uh, some closure. Uh, the person who was up, the woman who was just up here, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, can't say her name properly, but uh, 
um, she said that she didn't didn't feel like she could address all the violations. I just want you to know these are not all the violations. These are just violations that Matt happened to come out and confirm, and and so we see a lot of things that we've reported. But if somebody doesn't get out there in time, it's not a violation. I read through the 300 pages. There's 77 violations that I read in those 300 pages. Um, <clears throat> I think that our position is that there's a pattern of significant repetitive uh, violations, and I think you said that uh, in your summation. And then there's a history of disregarding those violations and the request for cure. Uh, some of them are bizarre. Uh, they, some of them go to just uh, are very trivial type things like using the city's logo on their website and then being notified to take it off. They take it off, a few months later it comes back on. And uh, so it, it's, there's a, a pattern here that goes over and over and it has to do with the CUP, the business license, the building codes, uh, certainly with respect to uh, uh, the rehabilitation facilities. When I was reading through it the other night, um, the 300 pages, I saw an email from the CEO who uh, was admonishing some drivers saying, your driver continues to stop at our business residence at 533 Lido. I can't tell you how that made me feel that, um, that I'm looking at something about the business, their, their business residence at 533 soon. This is a R1 area. and and it really is upsetting to us. And so you're gonna see a lot of violations. You're gonna see neighbors that are gonna report things like double parking and smoking and what have you. There's a lot that you don't see uh, where neighbors have gone and said to uh, the residents, you're not supposed to be out here smoking. And we've got a response. Uh, can I just have another minute if that's possible? Well, try to wrap it up. Okay. Uh, get a response that uh, that says I didn't know that they've been generally polite. They've gotten up and they've, they've gone in. I think our position is eight months of warnings is enough. We'd like to see some enforcement. Enough is enough. Thank you. Um, other people that would like to comment and to save time, uh, if you do intend to make a comment, you may want to queue up here just so that we save a little travel time. Yeah, Tom Billings, Newport Beach resident and also member of MORN. Um, first of all, thank you, Council Member, member Daigle and Council uh, Mayor Hen, for bringing up the salient, salient point of the uh, inappropriateness of a business in, an, in a residential neighborhood. Um, regarding uh, the, the uh, violations, as one example where the, the Morningside attorney just rebutted that, oh, yeah, we set up a designated smoking area behind, behind the, the property at Antibes. Well, they may have set it up, but as Joel just pointed out, they never adhere to it. They always move back to the front. A, a new group comes in, and actually in their defense, I've, I've, when I'm walking on the island, I've noticed them there, and I've, I've pointed out to them, they say, oh, we were never told. So that's just one example where, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, Morningside is, is really just, you know, not, not giving us, you know, their, their, the, the proper attention. In addition to these small amounts of violations that, that, again, Joel pointed out, there's been many, many more. There's been literally hundreds of calls, hundreds, that have not only gone to Matt Cozy Line, but to other uh, departments in the, in the um, city, including fire, you know, the police department and the fire. So basically, based on your review, you say, quote, it appears that Morningside is unable or unwilling to adequately and responsibly manage its facilities and comply with the terms of the zone agreement. Again, quote, pursuant to Section 0.1 Subdivision B of the Zoning Agreement, the City Council determines that Morningside is unable or unwilling to remedy the violations identified. The City shall provide Morningside with written notice. If Morningside does not commence efforts to achieve compliance within 30 days after receipt of the written notice from the City and diligently pursues steps that achieve full compliance, then Morningside shall be determined to be in default under the terms of the Zoning Agreement. So let's be crystal clear. You've already given them written notice. In fact, many times over the last six months, and they have not come into compliance. I, we, members of the public who are here today, who were here six months ago, were present in these chambers back in October where the public spoke out about repeated violations and grievances this operator, business operator, yes, it's a business, committed back then and the adverse impact these violations have had on our community. 
I also heard Morningside go on record back then stating that they would act in good faith from that point forward to follow the rules. Clearly they have not. It's been a constant stream of ignoring the rules. Their time is up. No grace period, no cure period will be tolerated. No more kicking the can down the road by the city council. Tomorrow morning, the city needs to send the fire marshal to these facilities, shut them down, and lock the doors. Enough is enough. Uh, Mayor Hen and members of the city council, I'm Willis Long here, a resident of uh, Lido Isle. Uh, by now, both the city and Morningside must be quite familiar with the operation of the group homes business in Newport Beach, especially with high turnover, with the high turnover rates of their clients. Clients are moved into residential quarters for several month periods, but most often move out within a few days or, for, or weeks to be immediately replaced by new clients. A new client is briefed on how to behave, but then moves out in a few days or weeks. And the next client and, and, and the next client repeats the cycle with minimum retention of behavior uh, to any rules of conduct and with little incentive for developing acquaintance with adjacent neighbors. It's almost a fortress mentality that, that sets in, especially in closely spaced R1 and R2 residential areas. This high frequency boarding house style turnover becomes very offensive to both the neighbors and the clients alike. In response to hundreds of complaints, not the, a couple dozen here, Morningside is ordered by the city to correct behavior, behavioral situations which by their very nature are unlikely to remain corrected over the long haul, leading to continuing violations of any acceptable operating agreement. Both the city and Morningside should know that it is impractical to, lo to locate recovery homes in this kind of a living environment. It is high time for the city to require Morningside to relocate its recovery operations to locations where homes are capable of providing more compatible living environments. Enough is enough. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and uh, honorable council persons, um, I've actually amended my comments. I'd like to May I have your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Edward Cook, 527 Violeta Sued. I'd like to have my comments read into the record as well, although I've amended um, after hearing counsel for uh, Morningside. Um, first, I'd like to recognize the city. Um, I have a great uh, and long track record with Kimberly Brandt on a multi-million square foot project in Costa Mesa. I think you made a great hire. She uh, has achieved the crown jewels, I think, of Orange County in Costa Mesa. I hope to be part of helping you achieve a crown jewel in this whole area with the redevelopment. I know a lot of the players, and I look forward to being of great help to all of you. Um, I'm here, obviously, to comment on the zoning agreement and to comment on Morningside. Um, but my comments changed because I want to address what Councilman Daigle said and Mayor Hen uh, when they called out this 533 issue. Uh, bought our home in June, building our dream home on the water was our life was turned upside down. We learned that our four young children would be living less than 100 feet from a drug and alcohol rehabilitation home. Um, shortly uh, thereafter, uh, Morningside did offer to have a small little meeting for immediate neighbors, which turned into well over 100 people at the Lido Island Clubhouse. On that night, the 21st of uh, October, I'll never forget it, I was sitting there reading, because I was just getting up to speed with all this stuff, the zoning agreement, some 50 pages or so, and I read all the conditions. And I started getting a little bit comfortable calling my wife and saying, maybe we can live with this thing. I walked down the street. I walked home, uh, somewhat dismayed, and, and looked and found two big moving vans with rats. And I, I, I'm sorry to call them rats, but they were scurrying in and out of this home. And I stood there with the agreement. I opened it up, and I said, it's 6.30 p.m. Excuse me. Your agreement prohibits this. The city manager was just at the meeting literally 10 minutes before. They were in front of the house. And I got the most knowing, violating, untrustful looks, I, I should say knowing looks from these people. They knew what they were doing. They were rushing to get into this house. There was no good faith there, absolutely no good faith. And I'm, I very much appreciate your comments tonight in support of that. But I really want to tell you, I want to bring you into my life a little bit. Last weekend, I went to a dinner party. I was sitting at a table with 20 people. 
I started telling the story about the impact on our lives and our family and, and some of the legal uh, abuses that I think this city council has been uh, put under with state, federal, and local laws that can force you to consider these kind of uses which are obviously not consistent with single family neighborhoods. I started giving my story and I was interrupted about halfway through and a woman too, to my right who I didn't know said, excuse me, would you repeat your story? And she had a little bit of an edge on her. I thought, hmm, I wonder what this is. I repeated my whole story. She, at the end of that, looked at me and she said, now I want all your attention, 20 people at this table. She said, I want to tell you, and I should have told him, that I'm a psychiatrist for the County of Orange. And I'm here to tell you that everything that he said is the truth. She said, if you, I'll finish in just 30 seconds. You, you do need to wrap up yeah. quickly. Everything he said is the truth. I take care of the very people that these uh, uh, community-based rehab uh, operators uh, deal with. 90% of those operations are not only unhelpful, they're hurtful to these clients. The first thing they say is they only want my money. The second thing they say is, by the way, it's the first place you go, Newport Beach, the drug rehab homes, to get your drugs, both illicit and otherwise. Number three, as a pregnant woman, she said, I would never dream of having this home uh, near my home. And she said, I'm conflicted because of my duty in my office to, from saying this, and I can't testify, but if I could, I would. I would almost quit my job to do so. That is my dinner party last weekend. Every woman, every husband, every person at that table, you could have heard a pin drop. Okay. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Um, please, please try to stay within the three-minute time limits, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Members of the City Council, my name is Barbara Lichman. I'm counsel to Mourn, and I would like to address a few of the matters brought up by Ms. Biavocato uh, in the context of her presentation. Uh, first, I hesitate, but I must disagree with your honorable city attorney, with whom I usually agree. Um, the movement of Morningside into 533 was not protected by your settlement agreement with Morningside. The settlement agreement didn't take effect until October 28th, and Morningside moved into 533 on October 22nd. At that point in time, 2010, I guess it was, at that point in time, neither the settlement agreement nor the development agreement, zoning agreement, were in effect. That should never have happened at that moment in time. Secondly, the occupants, the occupancy of 533 is not defined as a family. In fact, and I can't speak for all the, the locations, but if a location is occupied by folks who are on separate leases, who are not on the same lease, who do not operate as a family, that is not defined as a family for purposes of state or federal code. In this case, Morningside's residents have separate agreements with Morningside who is the only signator on that lease, does not fall within the definition of family for legal purposes. Three, sober living homes, as these properties are defined, or these properties are occupied, I should say. That is to say, six and under untreated people living together, as they are allowed to do, do not fall into the category of protected under either state or federal law. And please let me remind you, the federal law prohibits discrimination. That is, you cannot prohibit these homes from locating in your community. But that does not say that with respect to six and under untreated individuals, you have to accede to them living in R1 zones. Fourth and finally, it is clear from your presentation on Violito Village and the other homes, the residential facilities that are occupied, that these are a confluence of two uses that are now a single business enterprise. And as Mr. Slutsky pointed out, that's been confirmed by Morningside itself. If that's true, then Ms. Beatificato's presentation was in the nature of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It doesn't matter how many violations were reported with respect to 533 or 3204 or anything. What matters is they're operating a business in a residential zone that is not protected by state or federal law, and you need not allow that to continue. And I thank you for your indulgence this evening. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's, let's please, please refrain from uh, the clapping. Yes, ma'am. 
Um, I'm Nancy Scheffner. After warning Morningside in December of last year, you conducted an inspection in January. On January 27th, the city inspected 533 sued. You determined not in compliance. Complaints received include secondhand smoke, parking, noise during quiet hours, and delivery after hours. Another warning was issued. On May 5th, the city re-inspected 533 sued. You determined not in compliance. Complaints received included disposal of cigarettes on street, transport van parking and or loading of clients, noise during quiet hours, and deliveries after hours. Now we have more violations, and you want to give another 30-day warning. When will you say enough is enough? Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Lark, and I'm also a resident of uh, Violito. Uh, I want to start off by noticing that all the talking that we've heard from the people at Morningside and from the council relates to the residences. If you're looking at Morningside, you have to look at the whole picture. How many CUPs have they not done? How many permits have they not gotten? Uh, how many other rules have they violated? The biggest one, and this is the one I'm putting you on record for, fire. I. We requested a fire inspector to look at all of the sites. You tried to bump it up to the state. We have a copy of that letter. The state bumped it back to the city. There still has not been any kind of a fire inspection of any of these facilities. If you take where they meet, they're in violation on sprinklers. They're in violation on the stairs. They're in violation on the doors. They don't have fireproof doors. Because these residences all are effectively hotels. They are required to have sprinklers. They are required to have uh, fire alarms. This is on your back to make sure that nobody gets hurt or injured or burned. These people are big smokers. That's a fact everybody is willing to acknowledge. Smoking causes fire. You have not taken it upon yourselves to investigate the potential and have the fire department review all of their facilities to determine whether or not, in fact, you are providing danger to the, to the people who are, if you would, guests of Morningside. Thank you. Um, Mark Ruder, resident of Balboa Island. Um, in the city staff report, uh, they recommended the following. Uh, number one, determine that Morningside is unable or unwilling to remedy the violations and comply with the terms of the zoning agreement. And number two, they adopt a resolution finding that Morningside has not demonstrated good faith, compliance with the terms and operational conditions of the zoning agreement, and direct staff to issue a written notice to Morningside specifying the manner in which Morningside has failed to comply and state the steps Morningside must take to bring itself into compliance. I understand and agree with everything, but the last recommendation, why do we need another warning? He also stated, staff recommends the city council find this project to be exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, the CEQA, because it has no potential to have a significant effect on the environment. We don't agree. Morningside's operating plan is to provide an integral business project that integrates the rehabilitation facilities and their Lido Island, Lido Village complex. This definitely requires a CEQA study. Enough is enough. Roger McGregor, 645 Via Lido Sud. In your table, you report 50 warnings, the summary table that's been prevented. When I go through the report, there are 70. Quite a few never made it to the summary. In addition, you're going to hear evidence tonight that there's a lot of violations that have been reported, justified violations with evidence that have never found their way into any of this. What I'm saying is the, the problem is bigger than you're being presented here. Um, if any business, I have to ask you this, if any business came before you and had that many violations over an eight-month period, 
Would you give them a 30-day warning at this point? I don't think so. Um, I agree with the signs out here, enough is enough. And I'd like to add this. I've lived on Lido Isle for 55 years. I don't think I've ever seen a city council action with respect to the zoning agreement that has generated this much unified opposition. Every time a property comes up for sale on this island, the neighbors that are around it go into an absolute panic that one of these things is going to end up next door to them. This is worrying every resident on the island. It's not confined to others that are just close to them. Um, I'm the trustee for my deceased parents' house at 534, directly across the street. Um, the, um, I can assure you from my experience with this house that their justification for their fears is warranted and no sane person would want one of these, one of these things next to their home. Mr. Mayor, Council, I'm Jack Thompson. I live next door to the property in question at 533 at 531. Uh, one of the first things I'd like to point out on the cover sheet of the staff report under fiscal impacts, it says none. I had to represent to you gentlemen and ladies that maybe a 300 page report cost us something in time, effort, staff, who put a lot of work, just a thought. Further down the line, you look at how this whole thing came into being and how they got into 533. My understanding of a development agreement by statute of the state of California implies that the properties being developed are described in the agreement. Nowhere in this agreement is 533 described. Hence, to my knowledge, there is no traffic pattern or anything of the like reflecting this property. So what happens now is a dangerous situation. All their trucks and vans come drop people off and then do a hammerhead turn back into oncoming traffic every day, many times. And sooner or later, there's gonna be a rain collision in front of our house with kids in the neighborhood. It's gonna happen. As to the smoking, they put everyone back in the garage, for which I'm very thankful, as long as I don't go in my garage, because it's full of smoke. Sorry, it just is, you know? What can I say? The other issue with the smoking is, we had some very close relatives die not too long ago because smoking. They were smokers, house burned down, they're both dead. I worry that their house is gonna burn down with five or six innocent guys and maybe us too. It's gonna happen. Once again, the gentleman prior to me said, these houses have not been inspected or re required to act like what they are, hotels. Last subject, they are hotels. Why aren't we charging them a tax to help compensate us for all this money we're spending? With that, I thank you for your attention. My name is Laura Sharp. I live across from the garage that's full of smoke. Um, it, I think it probably was a big benefit to move the smoking into the garage from the neighbors on both sides standpoint. But the effect of that is now we get a lot more noise because my kitchen faces and my bedroom face that garage. Um, I've been sending violations sporadically since they moved in. I really haven't got the time and the energy to do it every day, but I see violations every day. I have a packet here of the violations that I've submitted that aren't on the list of violations logged. Um, and then some of them are on the list, but were shown as no violation. When I've read the rules, they were clearly violations. Maybe there wasn't enough evidence. And six shows unable to verify or independently verify. You can't verify at 10 o'clock in the morning that at six o'clock in the morning, somebody woke me up with a loud conversation on my bedroom window. You can't verify that the neighbor smelled smoke. None of that stuff's gonna be there long enough for anybody to go and check on. So inherently, you cannot enforce this agreement because you can never prove that any of these violations happen. We have cameras, I've submitted a lot of camera footage of things that I've seen happen, but some of those even don't end up as a violation when there's clear evidence that a car double parked or that a car was parked in a red or that a delivery is happening at 11 o'clock at night. So there's a lot of stuff that's not in your report that we, I have copies of I'd like to leave with you with photographs and the reports that were submitted originally. It's really not just a matter of 533. I also see a lot of violations that happen at the Auntie property and then also in front of the offices. There, I see illegal U-turns, we see double parking there. It's a problem that is the whole area, not just our local 
spot where our house is. And I think it's damaging the neighborhood. And I think it's not necessarily the clients that are the problem. Frequently, it's the management. It's sometimes the guy who's been working there since the unit opened that's out talking at 6 o'clock in the morning in front of my house. And I've seen Candace Bruce driving one of the vans that was double parked a number of times. So it's not the residents, I don't think. I think it's Morningside. And I think they have just absolutely no regard for what they've signed up to do. And they're not paying any attention. And I think it's time to get them out. Can I leave this with you? Please, please, let's refrain, refrain from the clapping. Uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council, uh, my name is Doug Dreyer. My wife and I have owned the property at 3416 Violito for 42 years. For the last several months, in fact, a couple of years before, we have been now surrounded by Morningside. They're in the two-story building behind us in Violito. They're on the two-story building on Bio, uh, I'm sorry, on Bio Porto. And now there's another shop down. These are not residential. They are strictly, quote, business professional offices. Let's talk about smoking. Our building has a passageway that goes clear through the building. The minute they have a break in their activities at Morningside, they leave, they come out in the alley, first thing they do is smoke. We have no smoking signs. We put up butt boxes for their cigarette butts. They'll fill them up in 25 minutes. So that plus parking. The alley behind our building is private property. It's part of the Lido Marina Village. There is a parking on the left side of that. There is a red fire zone parking strip on the right side of the alley going east they continually, with their vans and other vehicles, abuse that fire. If I stop out there and get a ticket by the Newport Beach Police Department, it cost me $270. They park there with impunity. I don't know why. I don't know whether they have a special agreement with somebody. But I think the real secret to this whole thing is, and I'm disappointed that the city council hasn't come up with the answer, how many rehab homes are there in Newport Beach and how many residents and why don't you charge them a bed tax just like all the hotels in town. You could generate a lot of money if it's legal. Thank you much. Uh, good evening. I don't know if you got this but I like like it for the record. Uh, Cindy Kohler, Concerned Citizen, West Newport Beach. I've been doing this for six years. I started 2006 begging, begging, pleading with you to help us on this issue. And what I don't understand is when I read the staff report, everything's in there, all their violations from the development agreement, there's nothing in there. There's no complaints from any of the people from the peninsula that we've been making. So it's, I feel that the record is not accurate. I just want to state that because there was thousands of complaints against Morningside from vans, it's all in there. I'm not going to regurgitate it. It's, it's maddening. Um, I have a point to make. Fourth of July, 2010. Dave Kiff, Mike Kenyu came by my house. Morningside Recovery had a huge kegger party at their, their facility. I made a uh, complaint to the state, and this is, I want the people in this room to know this. Uh, nine months later, I received nothing called we don't know what's going on. We can't tell you anything until it's closed. The bottom line is I said, well, they've moved. You know that they've moved. They let their license expire. She said, oh, well, in that case, then it's just automatically dropped. I said, why didn't you ever investigate this? Why did it take nine months for me to have to call? And you not investigate it. Made the Orange County Register. There was pictures. Newport Beach Police Department had to break up a keg party at a rehab home. Morningside Recovery. Why wasn't it investigated? I was told. The state is out of money. Don't you know that? We have no travel money. We are not going to use our personal money to travel to Newport Beach to investigate. The operators know this. So what did they do? They let their license expire and they moved them in Toledo. That's why they rent. Point one, no oversight. None. There is none from the state. It's all on us, the city, and our PD who has helped the peninsula out enormously. Um, Another concern on page eight, I think it is. It says that they are in non-compliance with their report concerning sexual predators, parolees, gang members. 
uh, I guess it's Prop 36. I want to know why there are non-compliance when they boasted, as I have watched and presented to you for the last three years, that they do alternative sentencing and work closely with the drug courts. I just am curious as to why they haven't submitted that to the city. Um, and I'd like to thank the PD. Because if it wasn't for the PD, I don't know what the people on the peninsula would have done thus far. Thank you, Bonnie. Denise Oberman. Well, as Cindy Kohler said, this staff report, uh, extensive report, talks to violations that have occurred, some of the violations that have been reported and those that have been acted upon by the city. Uh, for a period of about eight or nine months. In fact, Morningside does have a much longer period and pattern of non-compliant business practices, multiple com complaints, uh, several hundred plus, concerning this operator's business practices and non-compliance have been submitted long before the development agreement was enacted. Since 2007, there has been a concentration of complaints made to the city, and that was at the behest of the city council I want to remind you, uh, who said we can't just listen to complaints, we need testimony, we need evidence so we can act in a reasonable and equitable manner. So complaints were submitted. They were submitted to the city manager, police department, city attorney, code enforcement, fire department, and various council members. The complaints were similar too, but not exclusive of the ones that have already been submitted that people have already spoken to. We also have unsafe driving, fights, smoking, and other types of uh, inappropriate behavior and disruptive behavior to the community. Morningside also violated the city's urgent ordinance moratorium that was enacted when the city was engaged in development of the ordinance to provide reasonable regulation of these uses. The city at that time did take legal action against Morningside, which it subsequently dropped and ended up giving Morningside a blanket 25-year entitlement to operate wherever and however it may choose through the agreement under review this evening. Morningside has demonstrated a long consistent period of irresponsible, unsafe, and non-compliant business practices. There is no doubt that this operator could care less about compliance or the community, or for that matter, the welfare of its clients. No amount of citations or reasonable accommodation, quote unquote, would change this business. There is no good faith and there is no good 30-day cure for a business that has ongoing dynamic patterns. So what to do with this integral multi education use, which has established a campus in the Peninsula Lido neighborhood? It's not in the city's or the public's interest to continue to suffer these nuisances or health and safety index. And also, why should our city be investing all these resources in attempts to monitor or otherwise accommodate this business? given the pattern of practice that's been established over the last five or more years. Some remedies that are available to the city, the city has available to it legally and under this specific agreement, police powers and other remedies. It can move forward with enforcement actions. It can rescind or revoke the development agreement. It can cause Morningside to comply with the city's 0805 ordinance and require that Morningside immediately apply for a conditional use permit for its integrated business operation. That would give it appropriate due process along with the public. If it doesn't want to, it can be subject to closure and abatement in accordance with the provisions of this city's ordinances. Uh, and lastly, based on extensive compelling facts and the testimony of 2006 through the present, the city could also simply proceed with abatement of this integrated business for use. We appreciate your taking the action that's best for the city and the community that you serve. And now, thank you so much. My name is Jonathan Beer, and I own Charlie's Locker, which is right next door to Morningside Recovery. Um, we all know that Morningside Recovery breaks the rules almost every single day. I see it. If you guys need video information about it, if you need to see what goes on, I certainly can show you being right next door. Um, I've worked, I've had my store there for 35 years. Um, Lido is in great decay. It's getting worse by the moment. Having Morningside on Lido is not helping anything in any way, shape, or form. 
I am also a landowner on Lido, and I hear all this talk about how landowners are being privy to the information that you're giving about the redevelopment of Lido and all of that sort of stuff. It's funny how I sit in here and I listen to this and I go, I don't know anything about all the changes that are going on to Lido. Does anybody in here really know what is going on as far as Lido is concerned? I don't think they do, okay? That along with, it's just not fair having Morningside right next door causing trouble. I've had patients of Morningside holding papers to my customers saying F you, um, things like that. It makes them feel very uncomfortable. It's not fair in this community that we should make our people feel uncomfortable. Certainly there must be something we can do about it. What Morningside is trying to do is put a square peg through a round hole or around, you know, however you want to phrase it. It's not right. It's not right for Lido. It doesn't belong there. With anything that we do as far as the redevelopment of Lido, nothing can really be done with this cancer that's there of Morningside. They cannot, can, they can't, I talked to the owner of Morningside and I asked them to please stop taking every single space or close to every single space in front of my store. When he speaks, they all stop taking the spaces. About two weeks later, I can tell you every single person sitting in here, and you all know who you are, okay, who park their car on that street every single day with the master permits and make it so customers can park. I mean, what are we doing about this situation on Lido? How do you expect the merchants who spent years there fighting for their lives. And all we do is, is we cite Morningside saying, well, so they put these signs out, they did all these bad things. Okay, we're gonna cite them. But it doesn't make the customers any more comfortable shopping in my store because we're citing them. We're not doing anything to them. Okay, it's not fair. It's not fair to the community. It's not fair to anybody. And yes, they do all these infractions. They're all true. Okay, they park, there's 50 people standing in front of my store chatting. It's the most ridiculous thing. And for the city to, I always see everybody come up here and they speak to you guys and then everybody sits there and they all stare at you and they all look at you like this. Then you walk and you go away and absolutely I know no more before than I do now speaking. Please help, please, right. I beg of you. Okay, okay, okay. Mayor, members of council, uh, my name is Laura Curran. I live in Corona Del Mar. I'd like to talk about the issue that is um, under periodic compliance review, June 14, 2011, page 8. Um, the topic of parolee and government referral and managing and knowing uh, if parolees are in place in facilities was addressed in this part of the report in tonight. And when I think about the guidelines that ADP establishes, the um, alcohol and drug programs uh, to and the city establishes to protect the residents as well as those receiving treatment, knowing if we have parolees in the neighborhoods and in the facilities seems a logical step. So to read the report, it says, the Newport Beach Municipal Code restricts any residential use from housing more than one pro pro parolee or probationer for monetary or non-monetary compensation. So I would take that, first of all, I'd be interested to know if this is a code section or an administrative rule how this is managed, but I would take that if I were a law enforcement officer or a code officer to mean that you can't have two parolees in a, in a facility of this nature. To determine, this is logical, whether Morningside is operating in compliance with the operational requirement that it house no more than one parolee or probationer and no registered sex offender, gang member, or client funded by Proposition 36 at any of its Newport Beach facilities, the MBPD performed parolee checks for all Morningside addresses on February 1, 2011. Since that time, MBPD has requested that they be asked to supply this support sort of information only for criminal law enforcement purposes, which I would assume would apply to any residents that might have one or more parolees. Is that accurate? Um, it said the police department requested that um, Morningside provide information ar around about any parolees or probationers in its facilities, and I would assume that other facilities would also have to provide this information. 
To continue the staff report, on May 11th, the Code Enforcement Division asked Morningside to provide a verified statement that they are in compliance with this condition for the first quarterly reporting period. As of the date of this writing, Morningside has not responded to this request, and that was as of June 14th, 2011. So my questions are, what is the code section or the way this is actually stated and regulated? Who is responsible for enforcing this in the city? Um, and if this is, is this a provision that applies only to Morningside or does it also apply to other rehabs throughout the city of Newport Beach, such as at Clay and Orange or in Corona Del Mar? And is this consistently monitored? Thank you. One 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 thirty ninth Street, Newport Beach, and I'm almost a forty year resident of the of the city. I want to uh, actually thank the honorable mayor and members of the city council and Dave Kiff for what you have accomplished in the last few years on this intractable <laughs> problem. My questions uh, involve the fact that under the agreement. Uh, the home that uh, they were occupying at 11112 was closed on November 30th. I want to know if that residence is no longer part of the agreement in any way. If they were to choose to reopen it, would they have an, an opportunity to do so? Secondly, I'd like to know is there any reason for their vans to occasionally be stopping at that residence uh, to either discharge or pick up somebody on a completely irregular uh, basis? And then I'm going to make one suggestion. You've heard many complaints and, and the facts here are basically speaking for themselves. The, applicant can be arguing whether these things are significant or not. Well, how would we determine what a reasonable operation of a home like this is? And I'm going to suggest you look at one of the other operators in which you have granted, and it was the original agreement and zoning change, and see the kinds of complaints that you get regarding that operation and then you could compare that operation with Morningside. And I think that will help you in the determinations of whether or not the city is being reasonable in pursuing the closing or, or, or finding that Morningside has been in, in violation of the uh, agreement. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Mahoney. I have a couple of businesses over here in Lido Village. A year or so ago, the general plan for Lido Village was to encourage businesses and vendors to move into the area to make it more visitor friendly. Since that time, we've lost a few tenants but have seen Morningside Recovery expanding. Uh, when their patients are not involved in their meetings or treatment, they congregate in groups on the sidewalk, the parking structure, the boardwalk, and they uh, sometimes leave cigarette butts, trash, in the planters in the bay and on the sidewalk. Uh, this behavior, along with the occasional hysterically screaming patient, is disruptive to the, those of us who work and enjoy this area. Um, if Morningside wishes to be part of this community, they need to do a much better job of controlling this inconsiderate behavior. And if they're unwilling or unable to do so, perhaps the city can help us out. Good evening, Mayor, Council. My name is Nikolai Glazer. Um, I appreciate Councilman Rosansky pointing out that this is not focused around the Lido sued residents. This is distributed amongst all the Morningside uh, properties. Um, I am here to represent West Newport. I live on River Avenue. Uh, I represent the Lido Seance community. These people are not good neighbors. We don't want them on our streets, in our neighborhoods, and we wish that you will do 
the right thing to help them comply with our community. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, City Council members, thank you for uh, having this hearing. First and foremost, this could be about any operator's special zoning agreement. This particular yeah, may, one. Ma'am, we have your name, please. Mike Bransawatsky, Royal Island. This particular one was a well intentioned mistake. Let's review. In return for limiting bed numbers in Newport and complying with operating conditions, uh, Morningside got generous, unprecedented benefits. Morningside got future access to any homes in Newport Beach, including those zoned for single families, to be used as boarding houses for short stay clients, each under a separate contract for daily high frequency services, got this benefit for 25 years. They got exempted from conditional use hearings required for such commercial boarding house use, escaping due process and any input from nearby neighbors while neglecting the privacy of their very own clients. We've so far had 30 or so such short stay clients within a few feet for easy earshot of loud conversations, other noise and cigarette smell. MS got to concentrate such boarding houses near their expanding Lido Village hub, thus creating a whole new integrated business the city recognized May 13th of this year, under cover of an agreement meant for residential facilities only. The new business entity consists of central medical and other services as well as classroom campus the residences being the nearby dorms. This was not foreseen under the development agreement. So the residences covered by the development agreement no longer exist as separate lodging facilities. They have been subsumed into this much larger commercial enterprise. So is the original DA even valid? This new integral business project requires due process, so far has not been subjected to use permits, environmental impact reports, and other requirements. Quite the unintended benefit. Given these remarkable benefits, how is MS, how is Morningside complied with a high number of violations, to quote the city? Their first act was a double violation. They started a new boarding house prematurely and exceeded the number of beds. Violations of noise curfew and secondhand smoke restrictions are common. Conditions regarding garage parking for staff, client pickups, drop-offs, and legal spots are continually violated. Prohibited after-hour deliveries are routine, very recent ones documented after 10 and 11. Traffic violations by vans, SUVs, cars, public safety issue. Callers to the, quote, mandated, unquote, MS hotline have been disregarded or been called liars, like my wife. I think Matt witnessed that, actually. The required quarterly compliance reports were not provided to the city. Required proof of no government-sponsored or parolee clients is still not provided. Even the posted public hearing signs for this meeting were removed. Another violation not listed in the staff report. By the way, the staff reports omits countless other complaints that the city could not, quote, prove, unquote. It seems the difficulties, and if I may continue, or would you like my wife to continue for the next three minutes? <laughs> uh, I only have a minute. Do we get both? Uh, either way? <laughs> you get I'll, only one if you allow me to continue. I'll, I'll grant you a few more minutes. In I place think of having lived with this for eight months, you can allow me two minutes, yes? It seems the difficulties with enforcement and Bolden's morning site to break other city laws as the city cited them for expanding offices and creating classrooms, medical and other uses in multiple Lido Village locations without proper use permits, possibly also violating fire safety codes, remodeling those facilities without proper building permits, operating without necessary business license. One lesson for morning site in the city in this litany of violations is Placing and permitting commercial lodging in tight single-family zoned areas for clients needing all sorts of daily support services is a setup for failure for all concerned. The flagrant noncompliance despite months of warnings and fines proves that Morningside can't learn this lesson. Fines are of no consequence and they collected hundreds of thousands of dollars in the seven months or eight months from just their newest boarding house they allegedly illegally established. Appropriate consequences for such blatant record of noncompliance are needed. The bed limitation is not worth the continued contempt for multiple city laws, not worth the consternation of the citizens, not worth blocking the city's visionary redevelopment plans. Do not wag your finger, warning them they have yet another 30 days to comply, but that this time you really mean it. There have been plenty of next times. Do not keep asking us to be your cops and do nothing with the evidence. 
Do not waste money defending this fatally flawed agreement in court. Those of us here and citizens throughout Newport ask you, our elected representatives and leaders, for truly appropriate consequences. The city has ample legal reason to reverse this failed zoning agreement. In summary, an unenforceable agreement exists, one which obviously is almost impossible to be complied with, even if the operator wanted to comply, which it blatantly doesn't. Continued noncompliance is inevitable. End it now. Enough is enough. I'm Victoria Ransowatsky at 535 Via Lido Sud. How dare she say things um, have, you know, that there have been proper evidence. Um, Matt has been at our house on numerous occasions. Matt has been at our house on numerous occasions observing infractions, and every time, and I, I probably have sent over 70 emails, every time I do, I include a photograph. If I see people smoking, if I see cars parked in properly, I always send along a photograph, and Matt can confirm that. And in the past two weeks, they've been doing something. We're assuming it's probably um, urine sample testing. But we dot walk our dog numerous times a day, but late at night, between 9 and 11, there's been a car from a lab outside our house. A lab technician in scrubs gets out carrying a big box which, you know, and goes into the house. That's not just, you know, that's not the delivery of an envelope. That's this lab technician going in and out of the house late at night, and it's happened every other night for about the past two weeks. So I take um, great affront at, at what Ms. Beata Picado said. Thank you very much. Good, good evening. Um, my name is Julie Ackerman, 11 year resident of Lido Isle. And I wasn't planning on speaking until I actually heard from the attorney of Morningside as she was uh, addressing everyone that they uh, strive to comply. Um, I was actually walking here to attend this, and uh, a white passenger van went the wrong way up via Barcelona. And I was, I was very surprised that. I don't have proof of that. I did see it and, was, and even looked up to make sure I was correct on which way the one way on via Barcelona goes. And then I went around the corner past the Antibes, not 533 Sud, and there are two girls smoking cigarettes in the front doorway of the house across the street. And I was so surprised by that. I actually got out my phone and took their picture. And then they proceeded to walk across Via Lido Sud and into the Via Antibes house with their cigarettes, said hello. Uh, so obviously if they're being instructed to, to smoke in the garage, they missed the memo because they are smoking in the doorway of the neighbor and then taking their cigarettes directly into the house. So if uh, one, it's one if the patients are not being given the proper instruction and following those instruction, but I would assume that the driver of the van that's driving the wrong way up via Barcelona um, is most likely not a patient, and they also need to instruct their staff properly. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Marian Pickens, and I've lived on Lido for 38 years this month. Um, there are a lot of egregious things that we've put up with, and uh, I really haven't made any complaint to anybody about them before, but uh, we had... Um, uh, I was coming home and I looked over as I was turning to go up uh, Sued and I looked over and there was a girl lying spread eagle on the sidewalk there and I thought, my Lord, what has happened to her? She wasn't moving, her head was, and I said I, to myself, I said, good Lord, I should stop if I'm a good person. Well, uh, I didn't know if she had been hit by a truck and her body was thrown up there or what. But anyway, I stopped and as I was getting out of the car, she sat up and she rolled over to the other side. She was taking a sun bath out on the sidewalk, which is kind of unusual <laughs> when we have so many beaches around. But then, then we also, uh, we used to come by there and see them smoking and they, they take the two pound can, so, uh, coffee cans and they um, smoke that and they, they hold them with their cigarettes. It looked really pretty bad. And they never close the front door. It's always standing open. And uh, I have a friend uh, that lives just around the corner from them, and um, she goes over every day or two to close the gate 
parked on the side of the property because of all the trash cans there and all the things that they leave all the, um, and it's really quite a lot to put up with. And someday, I think now I'm going to get one of these <laughs> cameras with a telephone with a camera so I can take some pictures too because uh, actually the things I've seen are so ridiculous that uh, nobody would believe it. Thank you. I'm Dennis Schultz, and I've been on Lido since 1978. And um, as you can see, we're, we're sort of stressed out about this and, and would like to have our island have happiness about these issues. Um, is, it, um, is it in good faith for Morningside to use the, the seal of the, of the city? It is. That's a bit on their website. The use of the city seal is not authorized by the city, so it is not in good faith. It's not in good faith. That was a question. And, um, and it's so, um, it's sad to me that that there's so many unhappy people that have done nothing wrong that are asking for your help. And I hope it'll be solved because nobody wants to get hurt in this. We want all, even the rehab children to, or, or clients to, to do better, but not at the expense of others that have done nothing wrong. Thank you. Okay, do we have any more public comment? Seeing none, um, Mary Helen, did you care to make any further comments? I'll leave it down for a specific question. I'd be happy to answer. All right, so uh, would, you like us, would you like Mary Helen to come back up? Does anybody have any questions of the applicant? No. I, I okay. did have a, a, just one question. Maybe did you take some notes? Were you going to ask? Did. Okay, I'll let you go first and see if you All right. May staff make a response first to the testimony and then allow council to talk? Yes, but I just want to make it clear we, we're closing public comment at this point. So this is all now between uh, the council and staff. Okay, go ahead, David. No, thank you. I'd make an introductory comment to the gentleman from the, the, the retail store there. I know it does look like we sit here and stare. This is a process. We also take notes, and that's a, this is our chance now to answer your question. So. It's, a, it's not the best process. I think everybody on council and staff says that this kind of forum is really challenging to have a dialogue. But what we do is we listen to your testimony, we take notes. The council is good about taking notes too and that's what Mr. Hunt's gonna go through. So we hope we will answer all your questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Kipp. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you to the public and to the Morningside for providing their comments and, and providing the information that's, that will be helpful to the council in order to make the decision that is faced with tonight. I think it's helpful, first of all, to frame the issues once again. While we certainly as the council and staff knows, this, and many of you know, that the city has been working for many, many years, long predating me, in order to address the issue of rehabilitation and sober living homes within the city. It passed an ordinance in 2008. It went through significant litigation and still is in fact engaged in litigation for three other operators and one former operator. Um, that the disabled have rights under federal and state law that we're required to honor, uh, that we are to provide them housing opportunities, equal housing opportunities within the city, consistent with the requirements of federal and state law. Now in the context of that sort of devil in the deep blue sea world that we all live in, uh, Morningside and the city came to a conclusion on how to best try and resolve its differences in the litigation, ultimately leading to, ultimately leading to the zoning agreement uh, th through a settlement agreement. Now, as imperfect as it certainly may seem to many people tonight, it was an effort and the, I believe the council took action in good faith to try and move forward in this regard. What we're dealing with here tonight is whether or not Morningside has been in compliance with or acting in good faith compliance with that zoning agreement or development agreement. The issues predating the zoning agreement and development agreement aren't particularly relevant to the concerns that are here. I think what's happened is, and I will assure the audience as a whole and the folks at home, the city has invested huge amounts of staff time. So the gentleman who's talked about fiscal impact, right on. 
it's not necessarily straight out of the pocket so that we're not going to be a decision they make tonight isn't going to say we're going to spend money per se but the amount of Matt Cozyline's time, Janet Brown's time, Kathy Walcott's time, Kyle Rowan's time, my time, Mr. Kiff's time, yes, it's all very valuable, and yes, there's a huge amount of fiscal impact in that regard. Regrettably, we don't have infinite resources. So while the public is frustrated that many of the things they complained about and properly brought to our attention are not reflected in the staff report, what I wish to assure the council of and for that matter, Morningside and the public, what is in the staff report has been, it has been investigated, identified, and, and found to be credible. So when we take code enforcement action, we take code enforcement action based upon either the investigation, direct competent evidence observable by our code enforcement officer or otherwise admissible evidence that we can use in a court of law. That's what you're seeing here tonight. I realize eight months is frustrating to many people. Um, the efforts that have been going on with respect to this have not been just kicking the can down the road. The, the City Council cannot act arbitrarily and capriciously, and I would be violating my responsibilities to the City did I not want to make sure action that it took would be considered legal, hence leading us to tonight. Now, with respect to the issues that are before you tonight, um, and if I could address some of the quick questions that we have here. Um, the city is not and has never entered into a specific agreement regarding allowing parking in violation of our codes. We couldn't and would not do that. Um, we uh, entered, the, well, talking about whether or not the settlement agreement was in effect, and I must respectfully disagree with Ms. Lichman, and the settlement agreement specifically talks about not necessarily being in effect, but in paragraph six of the settlement agreement specifically states that while, while the settlement agreement, it says, well, the parties agreed that prior to the effective date of the settlement agreement, during this same period of time, the city shall not enforce any provision of ordinance, of the ordinance being 2008-05, against Morningside, and Morningside agrees to apply, uh, abide by the operational conditions. Hence, the issue of the creation of the Vialito Sud uh, position or the house at 533, it was consistent with the operational conditions as approved under the settlement agreement. The, the, the question that's really before the council tonight is, is do you find that Morningside has not acted in good faith and is either not capable or not willing to comply with the agreement? If so, the action, the only action available to you under the zoning agreement is to instruct staff to give them notice pursuant to paragraph O under the agreement. Uh, paragraph O has two provisions within it. One uh, A of under O states that we are entitled to utilize all of our administrative citations uh, and other uh, discretionary actions to enforce the operational conditions until such time as the City Council at a noticed public hearing deems that Morningside is unable or unwilling to remedy the violations and comply with the terms of the zoning agreement. That's what we're here for. If you make that determination, the next thing it states in that paragraph, at that point, Subdivision B of this section applies. Pursuant to the Government Code Section 65865.1, which is, deals with development agreements, if the city determines Morningside has not complied in good faith with the obligations, the city shall, which in the law means we do it, shall, by written notice to Morningside, specify the manner in which Morningside has failed to comply and state the steps Morningside must take to bring itself into compliance. If Morningside does not commence efforts to achieve compliance within 30 days after written receipt of notice from the city specifying the manner, then Morningside shall be deemed to be in default under the terms of the zoning agreement. And then it goes on to state what other remedies we have pursuant to that default. But Morningside cannot be found in default by this council absent the 30-day notice to cure. And frankly, if I said anything else, I would be abrogating my responsibility to this council and yes, to this community to try and be, give competent legal advice. So what are you faced with? Um, a number of different questions regarding, regarding actual compliance. You have substantial evidence that, that supports the recommendation of the staff and you certainly have it within your power in order to make the determination and approve and adopt the, the resolution. Um, there were issues brought up with respect to fire inspection. I would point out that fire inspection in a single family residential zone, which is in fact an R3 occupancy, does not trigger the need for fire inspection. However, when an, with, when an operator seeks to, seeks to obtain an operator's permit from ADP, 
then that triggers a fire inspection. And yes, indeed, we did ask the state fire marshal to do that. But we have done we have done inspections of at least one morning side facility, and we're addressing the fire code issues at this point. Um, with respect to the issue of the parolee and probationary probationers issue. The, P the police department has a responsibility to utilize the information they obtain through law enforcement uh, avenues in a manner that's consistent with the California Penal Code. Uh, our municipal code is not the California Penal Code. The concern of the police department, and I understand and have to honor it, that we they not share uh, information that's generally considered to be confidential solely for law enforcement purposes dealing with penal code or other state code issues when dealing simply with the municipal code or infraction or violation of an agreement personally between the city and another operator. Uh, I agree and understand with the MBPD's position with respect to it and I respect that their determination has occurred. With respect to 111, 11, 112 closed, a gentleman asked about what happens if they close a facility. If they close a facility and they vacate that facility, they no longer have the rights to utilize that facility unless, under the zoning agreement, they reoccupy it consistent with the zoning agreement. So if you have a position, I don't know where that house is. If there's another facility within the setback or the distancing requirements, they cannot return to that house because they'd be in violation of the zoning agreement. They must maintain the separation, which is one of the issues that the zoning agreement was attempting to address. And I always have lots of notes, but I always get messed up on whether or not I've addressed them all. So if the council has questions or if Mr. Kiff has responses or other staff, then I would welcome that. Okay, I did, I did have one other question. Somebody uh, uh, raised this issue of comparison to Morningside to Sober Living by the Sea. We have done a compliance review for Sober Living by the Sea. I can't yeah. remember how long ago it was. My recollection was that there's quite a dramatic difference in the results of that review between Morningside and Sober Living, and uh, perhaps somebody can comment on that. You're correct. Unfortunately, I don't remember the exact numbers of violations that we issued at Morningside, but it was substantially less, excuse me, at Sober Living by the Sea, but it was substantially less than the Morningside violation. Um, maybe Despite the fact that they operate more locations altogether. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So. I guess as it relates to good faith and willingness and ability to comply, others can. Does anyone, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner? No, I, I just, I think it's all been said. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think uh, Mr. Slutsky said it right in the beginning. It's a pattern, although to me it seems like it's more than a pattern, and it's been disappointing because I think what we tried to accomplish was was good. I mean, we were thinking of the community and how can we get our hands around this and numbers and that sort of thing and you get caps and then you're, you're okay, you're safe maybe. <laughs> but um, this is, has been disappointing and it's been difficult because it, consistently um, it seems to be, I think someone said it's not the individuals, it's the, the management. It, it does not seem to be as well managed as we would like and uh, I think that the staff report shows this and I think that the staff recommendations are the correct recommendations. Are questions allowed? No, questions are, public comment is closed. Questions are not allowed from the... Uh, we're, we're not in a position to respond to questions from the audience at this point. Council Member Daigle? Yes, I had a, a couple questions about you know, this whole concept of curing a violation. And, and I, I can appreciate if, let's say, the violation was landscaping had deteriorated, so you cure it by, you know, adding water and trimming it and this sort of a thing. But there's violations that have occurred that you really can't sort of cure because they happened and they could happen again, let's say the smoking or, or some of those um, impacts. So h how, do you, how do you address a violation that's really you can't really cure it if you could, and then I had an additional question. Uh, thank you, Council Member Daigle. Uh, the issue here really isn't the individualized violation. I mean, if there were an individualized violation, certainly it could be cured. <coughs> Frankly, it could be cured in 20 minutes sometimes, have the folks walk in and stop smoking outside or take, a, like, take that type of an action. What the real issue here is, is the substantial and repetitive cycle of violations 
and I think it was something that was interesting that was stated by a member of the public with respect to apparently at least what appears to be uh, an unwillingness to or unwillingness or inability in order to fully comply even after the request of the city. It's that pattern and practice that cannot be continued. It's certainly frustrated the staff and certainly frustrated the, the residents as a whole. Uh, the issue is that they can never return to this type of conduct and that simply cannot be tolerated and that's what steps need to be taken in order to train and assure that they will not return to that and if they do return to that then there will be a report to the council with recommendations for taking further action. Okay and then and then is there, is there a threshold where one sort of or is it more of a judgment call? It's a judgment call based upon substantial evidence. Under the government code, the development agreements may be determinated based upon substantial evidence in the record before the city council. If there's substantial evidence in the record that supports the violation of the <coughs> development agreement, the good faith and the ability to comply as it called out in the staff report and in the resolution, then your determination will be upheld. Uh, ultimately, it will be at the discretion of the city council to make that determination. Okay. And then my other question is along the lines, I know uh, Barbara Lichman was very active and uh, extremely effective with others in the community on our airport and what was um, kind of the cornerstone of that was environmental impacts. And, and environmental law always seems to be based on this, the, the review is a sort of accumulation and in listening to the residents this evening, I mean, it's, it's fairly clear we're not dealing with an isolated facility. It is a, it is a, a campus-like setting. And so when you look at those environmental impacts on a cumulative basis, be it um, noise, be it traffic, I mean, what environmental review uh, are we, are we uh, conducting on these, uh, on these uh, applications? Originally when the development agreement came before the council, it was determined that the environmental review was not necessary in that we weren't changing the nature of the uses of any of the houses that the use was being placed in. The, the zoning agreement, because under state law, under the Health and Safety Code 11832.23, it states that these uses need to be treated as single family residential and we're restricted in our ability to take any further action. So the action that was taken under the zoning agreement was exempt under under the California Environmental Quality Act. So they can't be evaluated on a cumulative basis, e even though they may be a single family, single family, when you add it all up, when you look at the totality of it, you know, there would seem to be impacts that, you know, one could say were substantial or need to be mitigated or so on. Uh, just a thought. Okay, Council Member Hill. As the uh, New council member, I've never really had the opportunity to chime in on this topic. And uh, I guess, uh, number one, I'd like to do that. Uh, I am appalled by the negative impact that Morningside has had on our community. I've had the uh, misfortune of experiencing some of those uh, instances of what I would call roving gangs of foul-mouthed smokers uh, that absolutely destroy an environment as they move through it. And um, I believe that uh, as a city, we need to do everything we can uh, to stop this from happening. At the same time, I recognize that, and I've had the chance to review many of the lawsuits that we have faced and with a great deal of pride, acknowledge that we have won those lawsuits because we've dotted the I's and crossed the T's as we've moved through this process. And so I also respect the fact that we have to continue that because the first time we lose one of these lawsuits, we're in trouble from then on. And uh, so I am very much in support of the staff recommendation to move forth uh, with the noticing at this point in time. Uh, I want to see this uh, brought to a halt as rapidly as possible, but recognize the reality of needing to do it right. All right, please, please, uh, Council Member Curry. Well, I think the evidence uh, presented in the staff report and presented by the audience tonight is clear and compelling that this operator, unlike some of the other operators in our city, is operating in a pattern that is in complete violation of this agreement. And uh, we need to take action. I want to assure the community, we all up here get it. We understand the impacts on the community, and we understand that you want us to do something about it. We've spent nearly $2 million in crafting an ordinance and in reducing the impact of these facilities in our city. And the key to doing that, as Councilman Hill just alluded to, is doing it through the use of due process. 
and that's important that we follow in this case. But it's also clear, I think, that the evidence is such that due process needs to be followed uh, to move forward with the provisions that we have at our hand uh, to address these issues so that we can ultimately get to the impact on the communities. And this operator has chosen a particular community uh, where this use is particularly uh, incompatible uh, with the neighborhood and with the residences, and that's got to be addressed. So I, like Councilmember Hill, will be supporting the staff recommendation, and let's move forward to uh, address these concerns uh, vigorously and appropriately. Okay, uh, Councilmember Selich. Yeah, well, I agree also. I think the evidence is overwhelming here on this. Um, I'm extremely disappointed. I think that uh, we worked very hard on this agreement. We gave Morningside an opportunity to actually be a model operation in the city that's certainly shown a uh, tin air, if you will, to, to the community um, and really completely blown it. And it's uh, really disappointing to see it come to this, but uh, I'm compelled to uh, follow the staff recommendation on this. Well, speaking for myself, um, I would have to say I feel scorned by all of this. Uh, I'll admit I was part of the uh, discussion here originally when we talked about putting together this settlement agreement and this zoning agreement with Morningside. I did so on uh, good faith uh, understanding that we were dealing with someone that would act in good faith to um, execute this agreement faithfully. Um, you know, uh, it's arguable whether the agreement itself, whether the trade-offs that were originally identified in all of this were good trade-offs. Um, clearly, uh, the agreement has not been followed appropriately, and uh, I am even more deeply disappointed than perhaps some others up here to that effect, having had a hand in it to start with. Given that, though, um, I am even more determined that we get execution or we deal with the consequences quickly and effectively uh, on these violations. And, I, you know, there's this, there's been a strain of thought here, impliedly or otherwise, that there are these uh, requirements in the operating conditions and it's extremely hard, maybe impossible to comply. Well, that's just not true because we have another operator in the city that apparently is able to comply. They can comply. This is an agreement that could be respected. It hasn't been. And so uh, for that reason, um, I'm going to move the uh, recommended action by staff. Second. All right, Council Member Rosansky. Yeah, I'll just um, close out my comments with the, the zoning agreement only works if both parties are willing to move forward in good faith. Yeah, I mean, we, we each needed to get the benefit of our bargain. and. I like Mayor Han, who just said that you know he's disappointed and 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 the results of the agreement. You know we're not getting the benefit of our bargain, and you know clearly we're going to have to give them 30 days notice to cure because that's what the agreement calls for and that's what our city attorney is recommending and and I, I believe that that's the right course of action under the agreement that we have. But you know my feeling is that that even if they come into compliance, we really need to think about. Um, I guess working with Morningside to just terminate this agreement. We need to move forward. They need to move forward with their business plan, whatever it is, and we need to move forward as a city um, protecting our residents, enforcing our ordinances, and, you know, the chips will just have to fall where they, where they may. And it may not have results that folks in the audience um, would desire or expect because they do have alternatives that this agreement um, constrained or limited their number of beds, for instance. If the agreement goes away, the cap on beds goes away. If they go and get licenses for their facilities in R1 zones or R2 zones or any zone for a six and under facility, then we can't touch it. And that's what this agreement did. That's, what, that's why we entered into this agreement. But clearly, it seems to be more trouble, I guess, than it's worth because they can't seem to comply with it and our residents are not happy. I'm not happy to be here at 1030 discussing this. And so uh, personally, I feel we just need to move forward with terminating this agreement either voluntarily with the acquiescence of Morningside uh, through our negotiations with our city attorney 
or through the processes that are set forth in the agreement if they can't comply. Uh, you know, there's a number of violations here. They're not limited to the 533. Some of them I think are petty. You know, a phone number, for instance. I mean, this is a, this is a petty thing on the part of the city. But other things are not, you know, driving um, dangerously, um, smoking, deliveries at all hours of the night and day. However, you know, some of this stuff may not be prohibited if the agreement goes away. So everybody should just recognize that, you know, people are allowed to smoke on their property. I have neighbors that smoke on their property and sometimes it wafts over and sometimes it doesn't. But clearly this agreement just doesn't seem to be working like it has with some of the other ones that we've entered into. And so maybe we just need to reconsider and, and move forward in a different direction. And so I will be supporting the staff's recommendation as well. Okay, any other comments? Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Do you have to read it or did you already? There, there's okay. no resolution. Okay. There is a resolution. It's uh, on page 15, handwritten 15. Resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach for a periodic review of compliance of the Zoning Implementation and Public Benefit Agreement between the City of Newport Beach and Morningside Recovery, LLC. And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, we do have, yeah, that's a good idea. We're going to take a three-minute break. <laughs>
Okay. We do have other agenda items to complete this evening. And uh, we just concluded <laughs> item number 27. We're on to item number 28, which is the, uh, bu the budget approval, fiscal year budget approval. So do we have a staff presentation? I presume very brief on this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council members, you did hear uh, probably an hour and a half presentation this afternoon about the budget. Um, it remains our recommendation tonight that you hold a public hearing, welcome any uh, public comment, council comments, um, potentially uh, look at the uh, budget checklist, but also but withhold adoption until the 28th. So that's our staff report. Okay, council member, uh, Mayor Pro Tim Gardner. I have two, one comment and one question. One is that I brought up at the study session, which is the $10,000 for the Balboa Island Historical Society, which to me is, I, I just, I find it hard to believe we're going to spend $10,000 on the island society when we don't really support our own citywide society. Um, however, I do know that they probably have grown to depend upon us. So that I, I guess that uh, I can support this only under the, on the condition that they understand that next year I'm going to put up a hell of a fight if they haven't uh, expanded their coverage so that we have a, say, a Newport Beach Historical Society. And I hope that with that understanding that they don't go into any long-term lease if they don't have some plans uh, along those directions. So I just, I'm on record for that, that, that this is not going to happen if I can help it next year without some change in their mission to become a, a citywide uh, entity. And I do have a question. Buck Gully and the conservancy that's been managing it, how, I don't see anything about that, and I didn't know whether it was on there or hidden or... It's a great question. It, Thank you. <laughs> it is not hidden. Well, I don't know. It, um, the, we've, we, we did make a recommendation to reduce that contract somewhat within this period. Um, and, and, and that contract would start to limit use in Buck Gully. Uh, it's, that's within the city manager's um, budget amount. It's identified in, in the 8080 account. Um, we think for about $95,000, which frankly I think is still high, they would um, continue to manage that to ensure with our NCC, ensure our NCCP requirements. Um, the area is getting more unsafe because of the storms of this past year. At the same time, we have a grant application in that we're actually is we're getting the sense this will be looked favorably upon to um, construct the trails and the four bridges. And the city would require some match to that. That would come back to you if the grant's tentatively awarded for a budget appropriation for the bridges and the trail construction. We're talking about about $180,000. Uh, 90 is grant, 90 is match. Um, if that were the case, I would come back to you as well with a plan to uh, keep the gully open and safe. It may not be with IRC, maybe it's with our park patrol people, another volunteer group, but right now it's, um, it'll go back to the state it was about three years ago, which is basically controlled especially and close to um, public access in the, off, in the fire season. Right. So for the time being though, uh, the Irvine Ranch Conservancy will continue to manage it. We won't be spending in other words, we're not, we're not being penny-wise and pound-foolish in, in terms of Correct. we're, we're cutting, we're cutting them back, but we're having to put a whole bunch more city staff on or something. Correct. We're not slipping back, but, but it will be something that will re revert to its closed access during the fire season like it had in the past. Okay. Council Member Selich. Yeah, Dave, I um, get confused in all these grants. Uh, the Crystal Cove parking lot. Is the 414,000, is that part of the grant money or is that coming out of our general fund? I'm going to have to ask uh, Mr. Batum to comment on that because I know he just did an email on it. Yes, um, th that particular, that the total amount is 305. I think that the number you just cited was the reduction. And all of that money is grant money. The 305 is the grant money. Okay, so the 414 is the reduction in the. In the, the 414 total. was the original. Okay, and it's all coming out of the the. So um, we're reducing it down to 305, and it's all coming out of the uh, Prop 84 grant money. 
Okay, yes. and, and why did we agree to do that rather than the state do it since it's on their property? We, we actually, it's a coalition. We're working with um, state parks, and the idea was that we would, uh, you know, in order to be more attractive in the competitive process for the Prop 84 grant funds, um, we decided to include that in and kind of have kind of a team approach, more holistic approach for the uh, ASPS protection. Okay. okay, thanks. Council Member Daigle. Uh, yes, a couple things. Um, first, I kind of wanted to vet a concept. As you know, there's the Neighborhood Revitalization Committee and doing important work, including um, potentially along Bristol Street South. And we have now a, a project in the pipeline. We have funding from Caltrans. Um, they're accessing a roadway beautification fund. Uh, we're in the final stage of them releasing that, that funding from Bristol Street North. It would seem as if we were to do a landscaping plan for Bristol Street South. It would be similar. Um, and we have some funding for a planning, the planning stage that would that is unique to that area. Uh, so we could potentially use the Bristol Street Relinquishment Fund so it wouldn't be competing with funding for other districts. And so what I wanted to get a sense of is uh, moving forward with a plan for that area. I believe it's about $50,000. And then it it's basically positions uh, us as a, sh a shelf-ready plan. Uh, we'd be going out and seeking funding. There's funding cycles that come up with the state. Um, so the idea is instead of waiting for a couple of years is to is to move forward with the planning stage and then seek funding. So I want to see what the sense of what others feel about that. Okay, I guess I'd, I'd like to get a sense of staff uh, with regard to that, you know, before personally before I would respond. But. I very much respect Councilmember Daigle's interest in this project because I think it is a, an important landscaping project. At the same time, we did um, set in place a process through the neighborhood revitalization effort to help prioritize those. So um, I'm trying to be consistent with that process, and I hope that um, Council Member Day, we respect that. Unless we can figure some other source out, I'm happy to look at some other yeah. source uh, that wouldn't compete with those funds. Right. But, well, part um, of my confusion was why that area was even put into the revitalization project. I mean, when I think of neighborhood revitalization, something larger scale, and my confusion was based on there's already a specific plan in the area, you know, and it, I guess my concern was, was it even put in there as sort of a delay tactic on a landscaping project? I mean, because that's really, I, I don't really see what else would do up there beyond a landscaping project, but maybe the committee has ideas. Well, uh, the, I, I think Characterizing it as a delay tactic may, may actually be appropriate because what we what we're doing here is really trying to say that public works um, has a lot of things on its plate and whether we we were saying there there are these nice cons right. there's nice projects that need to be done can we do them all in one year or can we spread them out with council's blessing over two to three years okay. because we just we can't keep doing it all, especially with the big Civic Center project and the Parks project. Okay. Well, given that you are doing the $3.5 million bridge <laughs> next month, I'll cut you guys some slack. Right. But I would like to see that happen. Um, so maybe next okay. year this will come back well, or through that committee. You know, I, I regard the work of the Neighborhood Revitalization Committee as it's, it's a dynamic process. Okay. You know, things will happen, it'll, things will change, and we'll look for an opportunity to address that, you know, in, in deference to Council Member Daigle. Uh, you know, at an early opportunity, I guess. Uh, like especially workload permitting, we may find some things fall off, and I, I recognize that that's, a, that's okay. an important one for District 4, and I think, again, I think it's a great entrance way to the city there. Okay. And then my other um, point, uh, a question is, um, consistent with our 15-point uh, uh, council fiscal sustainability plan, number nine is the city will consider competitive contracting of services and equipment. Uh, when appropriate and where clear cost-effective alternatives exist. And I had a number of areas that I wanted the manager to explore and come back with us. And the first one, I'd be really interested in an update from the police chief or from the manager as to what the latest is on this um, contracting out the jail with Costa Mesa and um, what your thoughts would be in terms of, uh, of how you would anticipate that, that evolving. And then the second issue, uh, the, th the other two um, areas, if you could explore and sort of, you know, tee up for us kind of uh, decision-making level 
um, information on uh, the Fire Prevention Bureau and also on call dispatch. So those would be the three areas, the jail, uh, the call dispatch, and then thirdly would be fire prevention. Um, but if I could get some response about the jail so we're all updated, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. That's a, a, a good request, and I'll, I'll answer as best I can. Maybe the chief can chime in if I've missed anything. Costa Mesa has a, last week had a, a close date for a request for proposals on uh, serving basically their jail so that um, potentially a public sector vendor or a private sector vendor could come in and um, work that that jail whether it's booking and records or, or a combination of those things um, they actually have extended that deadline out for about three weeks I think but I did authorize the police chief to make a response to that it's a little bit different from what they asked for what we proposed was having um, those uh, inmates come to our jail and that we uh, supplement that potentially with um, potentially with private sector staff that would in in a way assist us in managing the jail to the level our own jail that we think is is appropriate and allow us to explore whether a private sector model is appropriate for our jail or their jail so we did um, I authorized that based on uh, a further council approval and examination of that response but uh, we ex we did hear back from them they got the response but again they extended that deadline out for a couple more weeks and if I missed anything Chief Johnson okay All right great those would be my comments and really appreciate the staff's really adherence and their initiative and leadership on our fiscal sustainability plan so thank you all right. Well, I think the, the recommendation earlier this evening what is, is that it's a bit premature to act on the budget, budget resolution tonight. Um, I, I'm guessing it's also premature to act line by line on the budget checklist because I think I heard you say earlier you're going to be coming back with some fairly significant revisions to this at the next council well, meeting. Yes, and, and as we do that, I, I think it, it might be appropriate, though, to make sure that I am headed down the right path and the staff is headed down the right path on a couple of different things we talked about. One is the helicopter air support, uh, that you believe we are headed down the right path on that. Secondly is the way we'd be handling the DARE program. Um, thirdly is the lifeguard consensus proposal, that we uh, we would come back and include that in the um, the amended budget through a budget checklist item so I'm going to assume unless you tell me otherwise right now that um, those that you're uh, you're accepting of that path on those critical items well let me let me provide an opportunity for anyone to register an objection a lot of silence here no I'll, I requested additional information about pension plans you on did the lifeguard yes. and I would like to receive that before the next okay meeting. Okay, is that guidance? That is, thank you. That is good guidance. Thank you. Okay, do we? Uh, is this an item that we need to continue then, or? You, you do want to allow the, yeah. some public input next, and then um, at least for items uh, two and three, you'd continue that to the twenty eighth. Okay, so we'll open the public hearing. Uh, is there anyone that wishes to make a comment? Anyone from the member of the public that would like to comment on? Item number 28, the budget adoption. Yes, Mayor Hen and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosher, and I'd like to make two really quick comments. I just note on page one, as uh, somebody mentioned in connection with Morningside, where it says there is no fiscal impact related to this item to the public. That sounds a bit ironic. And uh, on the, at the top of the budget checklist, with respect to the Balboa Island Historical Society, I wanted to make the same comment I make to three of you at the Finance Committee meeting, uh, which was, as far as the public knows, this item here, Fund 110-8250, in the published online budget, all that is is it's single line. It says Special Department Expense, NOC, whatever that stands for, of $300,000. So without knowing what other expenses like this are making up the 300000 the public is really hard to participate in the discussion of whether the Balboa Island Historical Society is how, how that relates to the other 300,000 of things we don't know what they are. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other public comment? 
You know, it strikes me in view of the fact that we're going to have significant revision of this, we probably should continue the public hearing then until the 28th. Is that the appropriate way to do it? Yeah. You, you absolutely, you can. Because there will be new information presented at that meeting and we ought to provide the public an opportunity to comment again. Okay. Then I think there's no further action to take on this item at this point. Is that correct? If you're going to continue the public hearing uh, to the, the next agenda, then you should have a motion to continue. Move to continue. All right. Second. All right. Further conversation? Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Uh, we're on to item number 29, the compensation philosophy. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, this item is a uh, the Council's proposal to adopt a compensation philosophy that includes everything from what we compare ourselves to, private sector, public sector, the level of sharing that uh, the employees might uh, be asked to contribute in terms of pension programs, a diversification of pension alternatives, um, looks at how we classify our, our, uh, the jobs in, within the city. We have multiple classifications. The goal is to start to narrow those down and to look at a variety of other things that in, in effect sets a tone for the council approaching the next negotiation process and then continuing through there. So with that, um, welcome your questions. Uh, the council has looked at this before and it would be the first time we've adopted this or you've adopted this. So it is groundbreaking in that sense. Okay, council comments? Council member Curry. Well, first of all, I just want to uh, congratulate uh, you, Mayor Hand, because you initiated this, and I think it really is an excellent statement of policy that builds on what we've done before with the fiscal sustainability plan and with our uh, facilities financing plan and sits another pillar about good fiscal policy for the city going forward and good management philosophy that we can build on. And, and I think you should be congratulated for this initiative, and I think it uh, further solidifies our position as a fiscally strong and secure uh, jurisdiction. Thank you. Councilmember Daigle? Uh, yes, also wanted to recognize the mayor's leadership on this um, particular policy. And there's a number of um, elements that I wanted to highlight. Uh, first is that we're going to be increasing the withholding of um, pension contributions from our employees. Uh, secondly is we're going to be utilizing uh, comparisons to the private sector. Um, so we're going to provide uh, for other comparisons. And then thirdly, the, the measurement for uh, final compensation is going to go from a one year um, to a three year. And one of the reasons for that is if is there's any kind of spiking that could go on in a one year period, um, that impact is clearly dampened in a, in a three year period. Um, and I think um, one thing we might want to consider down the line is to take that policy and, and actually amend our PERS plan so that our plan reflects that three year uh, measurement uh, period. So again, I think it's, it's just uh, tremendous leadership on your part. I mean, this is one of the most significant policies um, that we have ever done. And I don't know of a lot of cities that are, that are doing this. So um, it's just terrific. So thank you. Thank you. Other comment? Okay. I would just comment uh, that uh, this is purposely written in relatively broad terms, but does have enough specifics in it to provide some uh, real guidance as we go along. Uh, we know we've got uh, a difficult path to travel here over the next few years to make sure that we have our fiscal house in order and uh, we'll have negotiations, we'll have a lot of conversation with employee groups, and we will have disagreement as we go forward. Uh, but the hope is that this document will provide a framework that we'll all fall back against as we get into the uh, sort of the nitty gritty and uh, the back and forth here uh, that will help us all keep a compass on where we need to get and lay out for all what that uh, path looks like in general terms. So I think it's already resulted in some good dialogue with our employee groups and associations and I look forward to that continuing. Um, with that then. Uh, Move the action. Okay. Moving in a second. Uh, we do need to provide for public uh, comment. 
um, city manager and a city attorney were both reaching for their buttons to make sure about that. Um, so we have an opportunity for public comment on this item. Um, anyone care to comment? I guess it's so momentous that uh, we're all overwhelmed. So, all right, in that case, uh, we'll close public comment and bring it back to council for a vote. Prior to reading the vote, there's a resolution, resolution number 2011-55, a resolution of the city council of the city of Newport Beach relating to a t total compensation philosophy. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, now, on to motions for reconsideration. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council, council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the Council members who voted with the prevailing side. Any motions for reconsideration? Seeing none, we will be adjourning the meeting tonight in memory of uh, Masao Kato. Um, he's an Honorary Life Board member and International Director of uh, from Japan uh, and the Newport Beach Sister City Association. And so I would like to read this statement then in his honor. Mr. Masao Kato, a longtime supporter and friend of the City of Newport Beach and the Newport Beach Sister Cities Association, passed away on May 24th. Mr. Kato was instrumental in developing and fostering excellent relations between Newport Beach and its sister city, Okazaki, Japan. A lifelong resident of Japan, Mr. Kato spent a decade working for the U.S. Consulate in Osaka, Kobe. He spent the next 40 years of his career with Japan Tupperware Company Limited, where he held a number of prominent positions, including representative director of the Tokyo head office and vice CEO of Asia Pacific Tupperware. Mr. Kato actively served a number of community and civic organizations, including the Okazaki International Association, the Okazaki City Scholarship Association, and the Okazaki R South Rotary Club. It was his service to Rotary that first brought him to Newport Beach and encouraged him to help form and develop our sister city relationship with Okazaki. He became an honorary member of the Newport Balboa Rotary Club in 2000 and an honorary life board member and international director for Japan with the Newport City Beach Sister City Association in 2007. The statues from Okazaki located in front of the Newport Beach Central Library and the Mariners Branch Library and the Japanese Lanterns at Irvine Terrace Park serve as reminders of Mr. Kato's service to our city, sister city relationship. He will be missed. And with that, we are adjourned. going to be torn down to make way for a freeway. Uh, naturally, he's very upset about this occurrence.